with you, the Chief Financial Officer of, of Fulton County. So I appreciate your cooperation with me to arrange a good time where we could be as uh, less inconvenient to each of you as possible. I also want to thank you for your responsiveness to a subpoena that we had issued that asked for maybe more information that even I recognize might be responsive to it. And I, I have a notebook here that you've provided with us, and I understand there will be additional documents coming if you want to just supplement those. I've spoken with your county attorney uh, as able here in the next few days or weeks. I would appreciate that. But I, I did want to thank you for, for making the effort to, to be responsive on relatively short notice here. And thank you for being here with us today. Uh, would you just introduce yourself and, and have Sharon introduce herself to the committee, please, sir? I'm, I'm Rob Pitts. I chair right, hang on, let me make sure I got you lit up here. There we go. All right. I'm Rob Pitts. I chair the Board of Commissioners of Fulton County, Georgia. All righty. And Sharon? Uh, good morning. Sharon Whitmore, the county's chief financial officer. You can pull that microphone closer to you if you want to. We had a little difficulty last meeting. Sometimes the volume's kind of fading in and out a little bit. That will allow us to hear you clearly. And also, this is being streamed live, and so anybody that may be watching on their computers at home will be able to hear the testimony that you give. Um, I am going to start with a couple of formalities here. Uh, we have in your folders, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the minutes from our first two meetings. The first one was held on February 9th, 2024. The Secretary of the Senate has prepared these minutes and uh, maybe a little tedious of a job, but easy because we are recorded. And so it's very easy to verify the accuracy. Uh, I did notice, uh, Senator Estevez, we misspelled your name on one of them, I think, and we will, well, two on both of them, we will correct that. <laughs> and uh, I told them, you being an attorney, it's going to be hard to slip anything by you on these, so we will, uh, we will correct those spellings as part of any approval of these meetings. Uh, have you all had an opportunity? We sent these out in advance to review these minutes before today. Any committee members need additional time to review them before we take action. All right, then I am open for a motion to approve the minutes of the February 9th, 2024 meeting. So moved. All right, I've got a motion by Senator Dolezal. Is there a second? Second. Second by Senator Kennedy. Any discussion or any review proposed changes or corrections to the minutes of February 9th? All right, then all in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed, like sign? All right, those are approved. Uh, now turning to the March 6, 2024 meetings. Has everybody had an opportunity to review these thoroughly? All right, is there a motion? Move to adopt the March 6 minutes uh, as presented. And with the amendment of the spelling correction, uh, got to accept that motion. Is there a second? Second. All right, any further discussion on that? And likewise, we will. Uh, Vote uh, all in favor, raise your hand of approving those minutes. Any opposed? All right, they are unanimously adopted. You'll also notice in your, your folder just a copy of our Senate committee rules. Uh, I put these in here because we did have some uh, questions posed to us from the Fulton County uh, Commission as they were preparing their responses to, to make sure what their timeliness was and how to object. I would like to state uh, to you, Chairman Pitts and, and, and Ms. Whitmore, y'all should be aware that we have confidentiality rules on this committee. If there are any documents responsive to our subpoena that you feel like uh, contain confidential information uh, that should not be disclosed to the public because we are creating a public record here, please identify those to me and I will, in accordance with our rules, deem them confidential and shielded from public view. Uh, I know that um, just in conversations with your, your county attorney, I, I know Sue has told me there are certain things that she has redacted in these, if anything that dealt with the birth date, social security numbers, health information of any of the employees of the county. Uh, and that is certainly fine. That's what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, to make sure that we are protecting uh, documents that should be confidential, but also obtaining 
the records that we need to complete our investigation and, and with the understanding that the vast majority of anything we ask for are in the public domain anyway. These are public government records that should be accessible to uh, the general public but also to the state senate to conduct our work here. So thank you and just let me know before we post anything on the website, any documents, if there are any that you feel like a need to uh, be shielded or protected in any way. Fair enough? All righty. Uh, before we get started, I will need to swear each of you in. Uh, Mr. Pitts, I'll start with you. If you will raise your right hand, please, sir. Do you swear the testimony that you will give before this committee this morning will be the truth, the whole truth, and the, uh, to the best of your knowledge and ability? I do. All right. And Ms. Whitmore, would you likewise? You swear the testimony you'll provide this morning will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes. All right. We have our court reporter present. We'll be making a transcript of all the, the testimony, and we're happy to share that with you. It will become part of the public record afterwards. If you later uh, want to correct any answers or add information, we welcome that. And I will state before we begin, as we say every meeting, that uh, our Senate website is set up that if anybody from the public has information you think might be relevant to our investigation, feel free uh, to reach out to us and, and provide any information that could be relevant to us and uh, let us know if you would like to testify before this committee as our process unfolds throughout the summer and the fall. Mr. Pitts, let me get you just to give us a little brief background. You and I know each other, yes, and sir. I think most people in Fulton County know of you from your long history of public service. If you would tell us a little bit about uh, the position you hold and how long you've been in the chairman's post and uh, any other political service before that, I think it might give some context. Thank you, uh, Senator, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've been, as you've indicated, been involved as, as a, an elected official for many years. And I look at uh, Senator Butler and I kind of count sometimes to figure out just who, who, uh, who is still standing. And I'm sorry that you're going to be leaving us. But I began my political career in Atlanta as a member of the Atlanta City Council. I served there for 20 years as a member of the Atlanta City Council. Then I was elected as president of the city council. I served four years as president. Then I moved over to the county where I served for, I think, 12 years as a member of a commission, as a commissioner. And for the last seven or eight years, I have been privileged to serve as chair of the board of commissioners of Fulton County. All right. And as in that position, uh, how often do you does your commission meet? Is it twice a month? We meet one? the first and third uh, Wednesdays of every month. Okay. Is it part of the, the duties and responsibilities of the Fulton County Commission to uh, establish the budget for the district attorney's office and some supervision of that office? We establish uh, the budget for the district attorney as well as all other departments for final approval. And when you are formulating the budgets, does the district attorney submit to you a budget request for public funding? The, the process, and I'll defer to our chief financial officer, but there's a process where the department heads uh, appear before the uh, manager and the finance team to explain their request, and then uh, from there it comes to us for final approval. We might want to clarify. So the budgets of all so the county departments, including the district attorney's office, are ultimately approved by the county commission? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Ms. Whitmore, if it's okay with you, I may bounce back and forth between witnesses because I understand, as the chairman just deferred to you, there are areas where you have uh, particular expertise. Okay. Yes, that's fine. Brenda, I'm not going to make your life as miserable as you're sitting there thinking right now. Our court reporter is going to try to keep a transcript, but you will occasionally have to go back and forth between witnesses. Uh, I will have, uh, I'm going to have Ms. Whitmore later a direct line of questioning her, but I may periodically let her chime in here, okay? All right. Karen, uh, tell us a, bit, a little bit about that, how that budgeting process works. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Chairman Pitt's description is um, the, the general process. Um, actually, every uh, 
department of county government, including uh, constitutional um, officers and elected officials, submit a annual budget request uh, through our um, budget development application. Those requests are reviewed, um, vetted, and uh, verified through our budget office. Um, the county's budget ordinance is designed in a, in a way that the budget is developed and presented to the Board of Commissioners um, as a recommendation from the Office of the County Manager. So we have a um, review process that we undertake um, with the County Manager and members of his executive team to review the requests that uh, are presented. Typically, we provide each agency with a base budget figure to start with, and then they are allowed to um, submit what we call budget enhancements, um, where they can ask for um, additional, re additional resources um, to just continue an existing program, to expand an existing program, or to establish a, a new program or service. Uh, they are also, we also have a separate um, process that we run simultaneously as the operating budget for a uh, capital uh, capital budget requests and there is a um, capital budget review committee that receives and vets all of those requests and um, they are then in turn taken into consideration at the same time as operating budget requests because we, we only have one pool of resources to use. Um, so we consider all of those at the same time. So our constitutional officers um, and elected officials submit their requests um, through the same uh, channels. Uh, sometimes they may choose not to um, come and present to the county manager's office and then choose instead to um, communicate their budget needs directly with the um, board of commissioners. So that in a nutshell is the county budget process. And when you talk about capital expenditures, is that like uh, new automobiles for police departments, new buildings, new uh, expenditures on things along those uh, other than personnel? Yes, yes sir. Um, uh, rolling stock, heavy equipment, um, facility renovation, new facilities, um, facility expansion, all, all of that would come through our um, uh, capital portal process. So when we talk about building a new county jail, that's a capital project? That is one very significant capital project, yes sir. Can you give us a, a just a feel for what the size of Fulton County's annual budget is? Uh, all, all funds including, uh, all funds included, um, it's about $1.2 billion. And do you have uh, readily available what amount of general funds from the county are uh, allocated to the district attorney's office on an annual basis? I guess we'll just talk about this year to start with. In 2024, the district attorney's um, allocation was 36.6 .6 million from the general fund. Okay. Chairman Pitts has tried to explain to me that there are several buckets of funds mm -hmm. that are used to fund the district attorney's office. Would you kind of run that through for me as to what additional funding uh, over and above the 36.6 .6 million of general funds from county tax revenues that are allocated to the district yes attorney. sir the district attorney um, in addition to the county's general fund resources um, also has uh, resources that are available through um, the uh, confiscated asset asset forfeiture fund um, as well as uh, the victims witness assistance fund um, federal asset forfeiture funds and we keep all of these in separate in, in separate funds, um, and then a number of different um, uh, grants that come through the uh, state and federal grant process. And then since um, really the middle of 2021, um, when we uh, developed our spending 
program for the resources that we received um, through the American Rescue um, Act. Uh, she, the district attorney has also had resources um, available uh, for what we call our Project ORCA, which is our court backlog project that, that was funded out of um, our ARPA resources. Okay, let me slow down on that one just a minute. Did you say Project ORCA, like an ORCA whale? Yes, sir. Okay. Is that acronym, does that stand for something we, you could help tell it's, us? It, it's, it's more, um, uh, I guess, visual than that. It, it just was intended to mean that it was a very, you know, an ORCA is a very large, um, uh, ocean mammal and uh, <laughs> the court backlog that we had um, as a result of the slowdown in the court system during the pandemic was also very large so um, the individual who was um, charged with developing a program to address the court backlog um, named it Project Orca but it is our official uh, court backlog reduction program and this is funded uh, through federal funds through our ARPA resources yes sir right. and the ARPA money was was put in to sort of help all the states recover from the COVID epidemic yes sir okay. do you know the amount of uh, ARPA funds that were allocated to the district attorney's office or the ORCA project I, I don't I don't have that number um, available with me today but I can share it and as far as the expenditures of that fund, is that anything that the county commission had authority or discretion over where the money went, how it was spent? Specifically, is your question specific to the ARPA resources themselves? Yes. Yes, sir. They determined where and how our ARPA resources um, would be uh, utilized. The uh, county executive team made a recommendation, and the board of commissioners uh, adopted that recommendation. And we have modified it um, over the course of time as we have continued to execute on our um, spend for the ARPA resources. And one of the um, areas you allocated some of the ARPA funding was to this ORCA project. Yes, sir. In total, about $75 million is what we allocated to uh, Project ORCA. And who else uh, was allocated funds through the ORCA project in addition to the district attorney's office? Uh, most of the partners from our justice system received uh, funding out of the um, uh, Project ORCA resources. Uh, the district attorney's office, the uh, uh, state court, superior court, magistrate court, uh, public defender, uh, the sheriff's department. Um, I, I believe juvenile court received some. Um, so we, we took a look across the entire um, justice system uh, to see where we would need to plug in some additional uh, resources in order to uh, develop a, a work plan to you know, bring our um, backlog that had accumulated to bring those numbers down. So if 75 million was applied to the ORCA project, do you know what amount of the $75 million went to the district attorney's office? I don't, I don't have the exact dollar amount with me. I, I can tell you that she did receive um, funding to uh, cover 75 positions, which was the um, highest number of positions that were provided across the justice agencies. Um, but I, I just, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't bring that. I don't have that number yeah, with me. I, I don't know, not, I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm not certain if we even requested that. <laughs> I know that you are continuing to compile for me the, um, essentially the, the ledger or roster of employees employed by the district attorney's office, and I suppose we'll be able to break this out as you compile that data, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, do you have any idea how many employees uh, in the district attorney's office now? I believe she has about 277 um, uh, employees plus the, the uh, positions in um, ORCA, so a little, little over 300, maybe 340. And that would include assistant district attorneys and investigators and uh, secretarial help, the entire spectrum of staff? Yes, sir. Will the ORCA funds expire anytime soon or be exhausted? I know if it came through ARPA, that's 
sort of winding down at this point, right? Yes, sir. We are um, in uh, undertaking an effort um, currently to ramp down our um, ORCA spend um, within the $75 million that was um, allotted and um, within the general time frame that was provided for the spending to occur, which is 12-31-2024. So we're at the tail end the last year of that, huh? Yes, sir. The way you described a budget process sounds very similar to the state budget. Uh, process where it's almost a continuation budget from the year before and then there are requests for additions uh, increases if you need more staff or if circumstances have changed or need to make a capital expenditure yeah yeah yes sir I mean we um, we tend to start from the the previous year and build on to that um, if a department received funding in a previous year that was not intended to be part of their recurring budget, then we make adjustments for that. That's why I said we provide them with a the base budget. So that base budget each year will reflect the ins and the outs from, you know, whatever transpired in the previous year's budget cycle. So if a department received funding for a particular project or purpose that's not intended to happen on an annual basis, then we we pull those monies back out um, and, and you know, readjust their and realign their base budget. Okay. How much detail does the district attorney's office provide when they make their annual budget request? Is it fairly itemized by employee, by expenditure type, where it, where it goes? In our process, we provide them with um, a um, line item um, version of their budget in our, our budget development application. Um, we provide them with a position summary um, so we give them a report of all of their positions, and it's as of a point in time, um, and, and they are required to uh, make any corrections to that position summary report because that becomes the basis for their salary and fringe benefit budget for um, the base year. And then uh, they are um, uh, allowed to go in and align the operating portion of their budget um, uh, in whatever manner suits their operational needs. We do have a couple of object codes that we um, uh, really do not allow them to deviate much from because they um, are necessary to fund things like our, um, our, our uh, risk management fund. So, you know, we have an object code specifically for that that's that's a rate times the number of positions that you have. So you really, there's no deviation there. Um, but they do have the ability to go in and adjust their budget. Um, they are uh, re requested to provide details, contract, um, uh, you know, contract uh, names and um, amounts for specific contracts. So like our Department of Real Estate and Asset Management would, would uh, come in and and identify their contractors that they have and their contracts that they have for things like janitorial services. Um, if they have uh, professional service contractors, they would identify them. Um, it, it is an ask. Um, some departments do a better job of others than you know providing um, a lot of uh, detail and support for for their asks. Um, so you know we spend a lot of time. Uh, and a lot of back and forth trying to understand, especially when they have submitted um, for an enhancement request or a, a, a new program, trying to make sure that they've put everything in that they should be including in those requests. But they do have the opportunity to um, uh, align it how they would like to see it and provide um, detailed explanations for their requests. Okay. And um, Chairman Pitts, back to you just yes. for a minute. Uh, that's why I was letting her get into the yes, minutia sir. there, because I know that's why you hired her, right? That's correct. Okay. <laughs> the way you've uh, explained it to me is that with certain elected officials that are provided for under the Georgia Constitution, like the district attorney's office and the sheriff's department, these are elected officials, and our state constitution provides the sort of parameters of their authority and responsibilities, right? That's correct. 
for those, uh, particularly those two, a sheriff and a district attorney, uh, do you micromanage their budget or is it fairly well left within their authority under the state constitution? Well, there, there are, they're what we call constitutional officers and we have three or four of those and then the district attorney is in a sort of a different category but also now I'll have to defer to uh, get the correct uh, terminology from from our county attorney but constitutional officers believe that once their budget has been approved by the Board of Commissioners, then they are free to manage that budget, budget any way they see fit. And that's because of this law, I suppose, uh, that gives them that authority. So you can't micromanage their spending once you've granted them the budget, the, uh, appropriated the money to them from the general funds? Probably not, uh, and that's, I guess the answer to that would be no, we cannot. But essentially you don't have to appropriate money to them unless they can justify for you why they need it and what they intend to spend it for. The well, line item listing that Ms. Whitmore just referenced. Right, when the, when the departmental budget comes to us and say even with the constitutional officers, they're, they're line items but we fund the line items and that results in a total. But once we've approved it, uh, they can disregard the, the line items that we have approved and therein lies, I guess, a, a, a source of conflict from time to time. Do you have a good grasp on exactly how much money runs through the DA's office budget every year? You know 36.6 .6 million comes from your general funds from the taxpayers of Fulton County and then they have money that they get from these forfeitures and from a portion of fine money um, and then they may have grants etc mm -hmm. both state and federal on top of that correct yes sir and then the state itself funds a certain number of positions including the district attorney salary and a certain number of assistant district attorneys based on the number of judges in the circuit that's my understanding yes yeah. sir but we do not monitor that. Right. So what we what we are aware of is that the thirty was a thirty six point thirty six plus million that comes from the general fund, and rarely do we get uh, do we keep up with how much they receive from grants or fines and forfeitures and things of that nature. Right. That's something that that's within the control of the district attorney's office. Correct. Okay. Do they ever report that amount to you? I mean, it would seem in the course of making a budget request to you they ought, they need to show a need for money and that would would necessarily require them to show you what they're getting from other sources to figure out what they need from you as a matter of course uh, that is not provided to us now whether that comes that is made available during the budget budget process with staff i'm not sure we will um we will um look at other sources um, that they have available when they're asking for an enhancement to see if if there is another source that could be used instead of the general funds um, and I and I I guess I would just like to um, perhaps add a little clarification to what the chairman just said about the other sources of funds um, those are maintained on the county's financial system um, so we do have the federal asset forfeitures, the confiscated um, assets. There, there are buckets of those. They are presented to the board in the um, special as special appropriation um, grant funds. Um, the board, there is no, ne there is no um, uh, reporting that comes forward to the board on those. Um, and, you know, because the board isn't... Um, uh, authorizing those resources they come from from other sources um, there, there isn't a lot that comes back to the board on those um, from a grant perspective like a, a federal grant perspective um, we uh, do present 
the grant applications that are made um, on our grant activity report to the board. Um, and again, the grant activities and reporting are captured on the county's financial um, system and are included in our uh, required single audit um, report each year. So that's the, the reporting. But there is no, um, there is no other reporting that is completed um, on those funds by the district attorney to the board of commissioners. But from your accounting standpoint, you're the chief financial officer. When this, these funds from whatever source get deposited in a bank account, somebody's got to make an entry. The deposit was made and where it came from. Um, yes, sir. So if, if resources are received, then they are presented over to the county treasury. Um, they're deposited. And um, it, within these funds, then the spending credit, if you will, is, is, uh, is provided to the um, agency that's receiving the funds. We have, you know, multiple agencies that receive federal asset forfeiture funds and confiscated um, asset funds. So um, we track it by each department within those funds. And when, when the resources are received, they are um, given credit for them. On the grants, many of the grants are, of course, drawdown grants. So we're spending counties Resort the county's resources first and seeking reimbursement from the granting agency. Um, so there, whatever the required um, drawdown process is, our uh, grants administration office um, in the finance department would be involved in um, uh, assisting and facilitating the um, reporting requirement, the financial reporting requirements. Programmatic reporting requirements are, are typically managed directly by the department or agency that has received the grant. But our grant administration unit um, will ensure that the required, whatever periodic required financial reporting is complete um, and that the drawdowns um, are completed on a timely basis so that the county is not um, fronting that money for too long of a period of time. And tell me what you just referenced, a single audit. What, what, do you, what did you mean by that? Uh, that's the um, audit that any um, entity that receives a federal grant is required to um, have completed on an annual basis. Our external auditors complete the single audit. Um, it, it is a um, specific audit of all uh, federal and state grant funds. And is that broken out between your various county agencies and departments, including the district attorney's office? Yes, the auditors have um, a, um, a requirement to uh, identify um, major programs and audit on a, on a risk basis. And so they determine which programs may get um, a more um, thorough um, and very specific audit process, but all of the um, all of the grants are included, and all of the information that they ask for is provided to them as part of that single audit process. Right. Is that a, a written document report that you would receive every year? The single audit. Yes. Yes. Okay. And is that a requirement of each agency, including the district attorney's office, to provide the the requested data and information to the auditor? It is. Yes. By reviewing that, are you able to pretty well track all of the spending of grant funds anyway by the district attorney's office? Um, at a summary level, right. it's a it's not it, it, it's not detailed. It just basically gives you um, you know the total amounts of what was received and expended. And what was yes, spent. sir. Does mm -hmm. it give a category of the spending? Um, I, I believe that it's just listed by. Uh, the um, individual grants. Okay. Would that uh, explain or reveal to you what personnel was paid for by specific grants? It is not. The report itself is not at that level of detail. All right. No. Is that provided to you in any way in your role as CFO? Do you get to see you know, which employees are funded by county money versus a federal grant versus a state grant versus a combination? Um, 
yes, that information is is would be available um, to me again um, when when those grants are. Um, awarded and received, we establish the budget. If personnel um, expenses are included in the grant award, then the uh, budget office will work with the recipient agency to ensure that the um, uh, appropriate uh, positions are um, established, created and established within the grant to ensure that they comply with, with whatever the um, application and the budget document that was presented to the granting agency um, includes. And we've had conversations before this morning as you've tried to explain to me some of these different funding sources. Um, it seems to me like on a lot of the uh, staff attorney or assistant DA positions and other investigators and other folks that are working for the DA's office that their salary is paid partly by the state with a local supplement, a county supplement. Explain that to our committee so we can figure this portion out. Yeah, there there are a, um, a handful of positions, um, assistant district attorneys, deputy district attorneys, investigator, um, maybe some legal assistants. Um, who are um, paid by the state and supplemented by the county. So we, we call them state supplemented um, positions. And um, I'm not 100% on what the total number is right now. Um, I think it's somewhere between 15 and 20. Um, I, I'm not sure what, which of those are um, filled. So that, that's part of the information that um, we have yet to um, finalize to be able to provide right. to you. We're still trying to break that out exactly. Yeah. Yes, sir. Phase. Yes, okay. sir. So what about a, a employee of the DA's office's uh, health insurance benefits? Is that paid by the state of Georgia, the state health benefit plan, or by Fulton County's health plan? Um, positions that are 100% county um, funded positions are paid by the county. Um, I, will, I will have to have one of the supplemental positions pulled. At one point in time, under a previous district attorney, some of them were receiving county benefits. Um, I'm not certain at this point with um, uh, DA Willis if they um, are receiving also receiving county benefits or not. So I will actually need to go and and pull that information. And what about retirement funds? I know state employees are eligible for state retirement benefits. Do, do you have county retirement benefits for these county employees? Fulton County has a closed defined benefit plan that closed in 1999. Um, so, um, if there are employees in the district attorney's office who were employed by the county and participated in that that plan and chose to stay in it, then they would um, be eligible for a defined benefit pension upon their, re their retirement from the county. We also have, since that point in time, um, had a defined contribution plan in place that is available to um, full-time um, county employees. We have um, amended it over time to include or exclude certain groups. As we've learned, certain groups have been added into and out of other um, other plans. Um, so full-time employees uh, have the benefit of that defined contribution plan. And that would be at the cost to Fulton County taxpayers rather than state taxpayers? Yes, sir. Okay. So there may be two or three of us working as assistant DAs under Miss Willis, and if I'm uh, one of the state-funded positions, I would be receiving a different type of health insurance plan, possibly, and a different type of retirement plan than my colleague that's uh, a supplemental employee that's funded by the county alone. Possibly, yes, sir. Okay. I will com I will confirm that in our response. What about folks that are independent contractors of the DA's office, like a special counsel? special assistant DA, how, how are they paid? Uh, they are treated as uh, professional services and paid as if they were a county vendor. 
And uh, do you consider them then a county employee or a county vendor or an independent contractor? Uh, a independent contractor with a, with a uh, receipt of a vendor payment. Okay. And in, as far as benefits from those type of independent contractors, would they receive any health insurance benefits or retirement benefits at all? No, sir. Okay. And do you, uh, in the county level, have any control over what they're paid? Um, no, sir. That's at the discretion of the district attorney. Okay. Does the district attorney, and I'm going to shift back to you, Chairman Pitts, have to uh, advise you of, of what's going on with these independent contractors that are being hired? No, sir. Okay. Do they have to request funding from you? And is that in the budget request that I need X amount for a specific uh, prosecutor or as a category of, of <coughs> assistance that I need to get from an independent contractor? Well, uh, let, let, me, let me try to answer that question this way. First of all, we have what's called outside counsel, and I'm going to make a distinction between outside counsel and a special prosecutor. All right. Explain that one to us. All right. An outside, an outside counsel is, or outside counsel is hired when the county attorney determines that there's a need for assistance. She then, in this case, she um, will make a recommendation to the board and explain why she needs outside counsel. She makes that recommendation to us. And if we agree, and that's typically done in executive session, and if we agree, then we will take a public vote and authorize the hiring on the recommendation of the county attorney of outside counsel. And we have a, uh, a range, uh, an hourly rate. I'm not sure what that hourly rate is, nor whether that's really relevant, but there's a, there's a, a range that uh, we pay uh, outside counsel. And that's different from a special um, special prosecutor the would outside counsel have anything to do with criminal prosecutions or are they representing the county's interest in other type of matters let me do you know Joe? Yeah. yeah i got the right answer i was going to th right. i thought i was right but i wanted to make sure we don't hire outside counsel for criminal matters all right that would be for dealing with other county legal matters that that you needed extra help from somebody other than the county attorney's office primarily civil versus criminal so who's the brains back there behind you you're consulting with it's Chairman. a county attorney what's her name uh sue joe sue joe yes and that's s-o-o -O and then j-o yes i got sir. that right yes okay sir. So joe i may ask you to share some information with us you're not under subpoena and it won't be sworn testimony but if, if it comes a time where you can help sort of enlighten us uh you just let us know or else you can keep keep letting the chairman know yeah. all right so those outside counsel mm -hmm. have to be approved by the county commission correct. and it's done on the recommendation of the county attorney correct or the request and that would specify the pay rate that those folks would be paid. That's correct. Right. And the second category. Second category would be a special prosecutor. And a special prosecutor is, I believe I'm correct on this, uh, that the district attorney has sole discretion under very narrow circumstances. Uh, and I don't know how to define narrow circumstances, but that's how it's been described to me, to hire, uh, independent of the board of commissioners, a special prosecutors. Okay. That's her decision and her choice. But that and would we have nothing to do with that. As you wouldn't have anything to do with the selection or approval of that counsel. That's, that's correct. Okay. Uh, but you would ultimately be paying for that council through the general appropriations bucket 
in, in the budget that you approve for the DA's office? For special prosecutors? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I'm told yes. All right. And you're told that by your chief financial officer. Yes. That's her job to know. Yes. Okay. Uh, on but those we, people. We wouldn't know. You, you wouldn't know the name of them no. or how much they're being paid. No. But you're going to see a line item on, a, on an audit at the end of the year showing how much that person was paid? That's correct. Uh, they're typically captured as professional services expenses. And is that in a group or individual? It's uh, professional services um, object code within the district attorney's budget within the general fund. All right. That uh, didn't educate me. <laughs> I, I'm wanting to, do, does that mean if, if Ms. Willis hires 15 special prosecuting attorneys and pays them $10 million that that's all you see is that 10 million was spent for that type of personnel or does it give you how much Mr. Wade got, how much Mr. Johnson and Mr. So our, our system captures all of that, but as far as um, how our reports roll up, um, at the object code level, you would just see the total amount. You would have to go actually go into um, the uh, accounting system uh, to extract the details of the payments for professional services because there may be more um, than just legal services or outside or special prosecutor um, services within the um, object code for professional services. So you got professional services. It doesn't even delineate how much is attorneys and how much is a janitor. Y yes, sir. Okay. So if I want to find out how much Mr. Wade was paid for his services as a special prosecutor, who has that data? I want to issue a subpoena to find that out. Do I give it to you as the county and you can discern that or do I have to go to whoever hired this professional service uh, provider? Uh, the county um, actually has an open, um, open government platform. Um, you could go to our open checkbook and you could search by the name and it would pull up the name of uh, any vendor that matches that description and you could find you know payments that way so you could go in and type in um, Mr. Wade's name or the name of his law firm and you would be able to pull those documents. Um, you could also submit an open records request um, to the finance department um, and the accounts payable team would pull the details um, and provide that documentation um, or you could subpoena um, that any probably the district attorney um, or uh, any member of her staff that is involved in their internal um, accounting and vendor payment process. Um, is it? It was included in my subpoena. Right. <laughs> so that's, the, that's my question. Yes. Can you find that information? Yes. Or do I have to go to the DA who may not provide? No, I, we we have that information. Okay. Yes, sir. And you can tell me the recipient by name of these professional services payments? Uh, what, what we provided today was specific to Mr. Wade. We are working on the request also included um, any other attorney, so we are still working on that. Um, our, our process is we are searching now through all of the transactions within that professional services object code, pulling out the ones that appear to be um, legal firms and pulling the underlying supporting documentation to determine if they were in fact legal firms and if those expenses um, are responsive to the subpoena and if so they will be provided. And I know I might sound a little lawyerish <laughs> here. I don't mean to be hounding you but I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that I address that subpoena to the right person. And I'm told you are the, the bomb. You are the answer to financial questions in Fulton County or can get them. If I'm wrong, help direct me where I need to submit uh, additional subpoenas to track down that information. Uh, no, sir. Okay. Submitting a subpoena to to me is uh, um, should okay. be sufficient. And I, I will say on the record, you have been 
very responsive and I know it's a, a lot of data and information and uh, I appreciate your efforts to continue providing that to me. Uh, Thank you. You have been completely transparent and um, helpful in trying to find things. Um, so you said supporting documentation. What kind of supporting documentation would there be for a professional services payment to a law firm? Typically their billing statement. Okay. Do you uh, have supporting documentation to show you a uh, contract with them, with the independent contractor between the, the legal services provider and the district attorney's office or the county? Uh, the contracts typically are not provided as part of the um, supporting documentation. It can be requested, um, but from you or from the DA's office. Um, if I have it, I will provide it. Um, if I if I don't have it, and it's something that I I can't get, then I wouldn't be able to provide it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, because this is sounding to me kind of like uh, the Wild West, very little control f from Fulton County over a $36 million budget. You don't know how much of that is spent on professional services, who is hired, how much they're paid per hour, what their total compensation is, yet you're being asked to provide $36.6 million a year that you know encompasses uh, a number of those type of independent contractors that you know, you're funding with no oversight or control, right? Yeah, the Board of Commissioners has no oversight over the um, district attorney. Okay. So your only control is the power of the purse, whether you fund, continue funding money uh, that can be used for those purposes or whether you restrict that funding. Is that fair, Chairman Pitts? I guess that's really your question. So could you repeat that, Mr. Chairman? So your only control is the power of the purse, is either granting or rejecting requests for additional funding from the DA's office. That's correct. Okay. And that has to be based upon assurances presented to you by the DA as to why she would need particular amounts of funding? Right, the, the, the DA can come before the board and, and make a request at any time. And we, you know, we would consider the request and if we agree, then we'll grant it. Right. If we disagree, then we won't grant it. And in that request, do you require her to uh, give some specifics? You know, some who I want to hire, why I need to hire somebody, how much I want to pay them, what's going to be the cap on there? We don't Service. get into that, 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 that sort of detail. I mean, she'll make a, uh, would make a case as to why uh, the need is there and what it would cost. But as far as individual names and, and, and what would be, what the compensation for a given individual, individual would be, uh, we don't get that kind of detail, nor do we ask it. Did uh, DA Willis ever make a request for specific funding for a special assistant DA, prosecuting DA, uh, for the, these, uh, for Mr. Wade? Not to my knowledge yet. Uh, and is, is her position that she doesn't have to ask or, or provide that information to the county in order to make a supplemental funding request? Well, again, the, uh, with respect to the special prosecutor that's solely the purview of the district attorney uh, unlike the outside counsel right. but you fund the district attorney based upon her stated needs or her requests for funding right correct okay in her budget request does she have a category four special prosecutors I don't recall saying a special category Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I guess I would have to say that she, she as have prior district attorneys, um, uh, have asked for resources, um, 
trial expense resources right. without it being specific to X amount for a, a special prosecutor or um, X amount for expert witnesses or you know things like that. I think that it's been more like um, we we know we have these major um, prosecutorial matters that will be moving forward and will require you know additional, additional resources. But it, I don't recall there being any specific line item details necessarily associated with that. All right. So we heard testimony at a previous meeting that there was a team of at least 10 assistant DAs working on an election interference case and at least three special counsel that are being paid as independent contractors, including Mr. Wade. Was that ever described to the county commission in any of the funding requests? I don't recall that coming before the board. So she never came to you and said, I'm going to need a lot of money here to conduct this prosecution of now there's 16 different defendants uh, on a, I'm going to call it the election interference case. Was that ever expressed to the county commission that that's part of why you were asked to give 36.6 million? Again, um, not with that level of detail. So again, trial expenses. Um, Just generically, not even for the type of prosecution. Um, I want to say for the 23 budget, and I will have to go back and verify this, that I did. There was some communication um, where she identified um, a need for resources um, because she expected to have a uh, to have to retry a case that had been a high-profile case, um, as well as the um, uh, uh, gang. Um, uh, matters that she has. I think there are a couple of those um, and the elections um, you know the elections interference matter as well. But, but again it was a lump sum not specific with, with line item details. Right. So you think that was in her budget request perhaps in 23. Are we talking about young thug trial that's been going that's gone on forever and ever? so far or, or different gang related i believe there is more than one um gang related um large scale um prosecutorial matter but yes sir that would be one of them and you think she may have also itemized the election interference case would require additional funds or or categorize that as a an area of, of needed funding um Yes, sir. I, again, I need. I would have to go back and and look. Um, yeah. Well, I don't because you don't have to go um, back anymore. You've got your right hand woman right there to help you. So, um, yes, sir. Um, that was Sabrina McTeer, the county's budget manager. Um, so this is from the twenty three uh, budget enhancement request, and um, the description says, and I'll just read it. Um, the general rule, the more complicated a case, the more likely expert witnesses, e.g. professional services, in, are needed. That was in parentheses. State versus Tex MacGyver has been remanded to this office. This case alone costs 675000 in professional services. I have this case and several anti-corruption cases that are being litigated in 23. Um, it is sufficient to enhance this budget, and the request was $1.1 million. So that was for Tex MacGyver and any other public corruption case? Um, yes, sir. So that's the kind of description that I was perhaps not doing a very good job of, no, ex of expressing. But you're, you're doing great. And, and as far as your recollection, uh, Chairman Pitts, is that she never named that, that she would need a special prosecutor on any election interference case not that I recall sir certainly never told you the names of who she might be hiring or how much she was going to have to pay them not that I recall sir uh, did she make other uh, budget enhancement requests 
back in 2023, 21 or 22. I'm, I can't remember exactly when she was sworn in. Y'all know that. Uh, Madam DA um, was sworn in and uh, began her term in 2021. Um, so we did receive enhancement requests from her for the uh, 22 budget cycle, uh, the 23 and the 24. Okay. What was the $5 million enhancement request for uh, clearing up homicide backlogs? Do y'all re recall that? That was testified to here last meeting. That was a um, request that came through in um, the middle of 2021. Um, she requested um, additional staff to support a number of items, the, the outstanding um, homicide situation being one of them. Um, ultimately, in 2021, through a budget amendment process that we call budget soundings, uh, the Board of Commissioners did um, authorize her to um, have funding for an additional 55 positions. Wow. Um, it was a mix of attorneys, uh, investigators, and administrative um, support personnel. And um, in 21, the cost that was necessary to begin to, to, to um, onboard those positions because she would not be able to do all 55 at one time um, was less than 800,000. I think the budget soundings was 780,000 and some change. Um, but the full annual cost for that is the $5 million. Um, and so we built that in then to her 2022 budget um, with the full year funding for all of the positions that the board awarded her mid-year in 2021. And was there any mention in that $5 million enhancement request that that would be needed for any type of public corruption investigation? I will have to go back to the source document <clears throat> to confirm that. Um, what do you call that source document? Because I'm going to want to make sure I have adequately identified what I need to be produced. Uh, I, I would call it a, a budget soundings request. Okay. And can you provide those to me without me submitting an additional subpoena? I think they're included in what I've asked for. It just I may not have been as specific because I didn't know what to call it. Um, yes, sir. Uh, we, I had intended to include the um, 2021 soundings information um, as part of the request for the budget information that was already right. um, included. You can just follow up and get that to me or, or Secretary Cook at your convenience. And if you would do that for any of those sounding requests for 21, 22, 23, and 24, just to keep me up to speed. Because, Chairman Pitts, what I am hearing from you is that the Board of Commissioners never got any kind of specific request for additional funding to prosecute any election interference cases, Not other than that generic one million, you know, in 23. Not that I recall, sir. Uh, and, and, and no specific information about who needed to be hired as an independent contractor or what they would cost. I understand Governor Barnes was too expensive, and I just didn't know if that's that y'all figured that out or she ruled him out for that reason. No, not that I recall. I am subject to hiring a man. Uh, right. <laughs> he's a, he's a uh, gun for hire if anybody out there is paying attention. And it's a pleasure to have you in the audience with us today, Governor Barnes. Uh, and, and I'm just wanting this to get a feel and um, for exactly how much oversight there is. It sounds like it's very loose as far as employment practices and expenditures for independent contractors. Yeah, that information doesn't come before the board. Right. Only you have to peel it out in these um, soundings and in the annual audit and in the budget submissions as she gives you the categories of what she needs. That's correct. And when budget soundings come before the board, uh, there's a little more detail and more specifics. Right. Probably pretty difficult politically for you and the Board of Commissioners to reject a request for needed funding to clear up a backlog in homicide cases, right? <laughs> well. 
I mean, we had such a such a tremendous number of cases that were so-called, uh, you know, had been there for up in the thousands, and we decided that we had this, the 75 million from the ARPA funds has already been referenced by Ms. Whitmore. Right. So in order to, you know, to, to we threw well, 75 million of the. I think we received a total federal allocation of about 206 million in ARPA funds and 75 million of that 206 million uh, went to the justice system. Right. And the justice system meaning everything that uh, the CFO has outlined. So that was back in the fall of 2021. It was about the same time Mr. Wade was being hired. Um, and it wasn't mentioned to you that any of the, the enhanced money was gonna go towards uh, Mr. Wade or any other special prosecutor to prosecute election interference? No, it was my understanding that that 75 million was to be used for the justice system and specifically, uh, sort of specifically, with, to, to reduce the tremendous backlog that we had. And there was a $5 million enhancement that was from county funds, not the ORCA funds, or is that the same money? Is that the same money? No. The five million is um, general fund, okay. county. And in that request, that was on top of the ORCA funds to get rid of the backlog of uh, homicide cases. Is that correct? Um, yes, sir. She actually asked for um, over a hundred positions um, when when she made the request, and the way in which we addressed it was we already had the backlog um, program in development, and so we identified the a certain number that would be funded through the um, backlog project out of the ARPA resources and the balance uh, we provided for out of the county's general fund. And this is back in the fall of 2021. Yes, sir. Uh, two years before her 1.1 million request for public corruption and Tex MacGyver. Um, yes, sir. Okay. Did she ever report back to you the progress being made? What uh, kind of bang you were getting for your buck? You're giving her tens of millions of dollars in either ORCA funds or federal, uh, state, uh, county general funds to get rid of this backlog. Did she do it? Uh, I don't recall any, any specific re uh, report back to the board from the district attorney. However, at, uh, at each meeting of the board, we would receive an update on progress that was being made. That's accurate, isn't it? Yes. Um, yes, sir. As part of our um, uh, global pandemic response, um, we presented the board of commissioners with um, uh, an update um, for a while at every board meeting and then eventually at just one meeting a month to update them on our progress um, using our ARPA resources and specifically on the um, backlog project um, showing uh, total backlog cases, progression um, of those cases through, you know, through the system. Um, and so we've been reporting on that regularly um, up until um, February of this year um, due to our cyber incident. So we are um, almost yeah. ready to begin that reporting process um, again. The last report that we made of the progress of Project Orca was in January um, at the second meeting of the Board of Commissioners in January, and that was for progress through the end of 2023. So. Uh, would that list the number of homicide cases that are pending and how many are being resolved on a monthly basis? Um, it doesn't list case type. It lists the total number of projects, uh, I mean, the total number of cases um, uh, by each of the um, uh, players, if you will, the solicitor the in the magistrate court, um, the district attorney, um, and then Superior Court and State Court. So we, we kind of track the progress of the cases from the two prosecutors, from the solicitor and the district attorney into their respective courts. And then we trace, we track the progress that the courts themselves are making in fully adjudicating um, 
the cases. So that information is, is all presented to the board in a, um, in a chart and discussion and, you know, what's happening, all the various different things that we had to do in order to, you know, see that line make the progression that we were looking for. So how many backlog cases were there? Do you have a ballpark to figure how bad this got back in 2021? We're a year into the pandemic. Courts are not trying cases. And oh, my. You got a full color report there. Is that Thousands. my notebook? We'll, we'll get an exact number. <laughs> it was. It was. Um, we started um, uh, our our uh, drop date that we used to define our backlog cases was December 6, 2021, um, and we started with a total of uh, 148,209 open and active cases um, in any stage. That included solicitor's office that yes. prosecutes yes. misdemeanors. Across, yes, across and the, the justice DA's system. office that prosecutes the felony offenses. Yes, sir. Does it break them out, which how many are uh, state court versus superior court? Um, the um, <coughs> state court, uh, beginning the start, the starting point for the state court was uh, 20,124. So the vast majority of them, or at least two thirds of them, what, what's the Superior Court? Uh, Superior right? Court was 15,888. Okay. Then you got magistrate courts as well. Yes, Magistrate court um, was 39,435. That can be everything from a speeding ticket to a parking ticket, very minor. Variety case. of, okay. Okay. yes, yes, sir. What else you got, municipal court, I guess? Uh, solicitor, the solicitor general had 56,462 at the starting point. And the um, district attorney had 16,300. Where's the 16.3 now, or at the end of 2023? Has it been, has the DA used all these millions to any good to catch up? Um, from our report um, in uh, January, the district attorney's number was um, 130 cases that were that were the original ORCA. So this is only tracking the cases that were considered in the ORCA backlog um, that started at 148. So again, that these resources were only supposed to be focused on reducing those cases. Um, there were still um, new cases, of course, that come into the system since that point in time. Right. And this report does not talk about those. This is specifically focused on those ORCA cases. Th those new ones are not funded through the ORCA funding. Correct. Okay. Correct. That makes sense. For um, for who you start for the DA? You started at sixteen thousand three hundred and ended up with one hundred and thirty. Yes, sir. Okay, and that was from uh, December sixth of twenty twenty one through twelve thirty one twenty twenty three. And we we can't discern whether they're dismissed cases, whether they're plea bargain cases, or trials to a verdict. Not from this report, okay. no, sir. They just got out of the system resolved one way or another. So for the district attorney, they were either um, um, uh, moved on to superior court, which is where her cases would typically go, um, which means she still has to then prosecute them. Um, but <coughs> what we were tracking is, you know, the cases that she had where, you know, they were still sitting in, per se, in her queue, if you will. Yeah. Um, and um, so, from 16.3 down to 130, they either moved up, they either moved on in, into the prosecutorial, further into the prosecutorial process, or yes, they were um, dismissed or whatever the other term is that you would use when um, a, a court case doesn't progress, when a matter doesn't progress. Did your reporting requirements for these ORCA funds uh, require any detail as to the successful completion of a case, whether there was a conviction or a plea or they just dismissed it or did, did they break it down for you that way or, or just a one lump sum number of these cases are resolved they're no longer in our system in our queue um, we did not um, re require that reporting that level of reporting to the board of commissioners um, 
we do have, I believe, that level of reporting from our criminal justice system, but it's, it's just not included in what we reported to the board. And does that criminal justice system of Fulton County prepare a report giving those annual updates or dispositions of cases? They have not. This is something that the executive team um, uh, worked on. For Project ORCA, there was a steering committee that was established um, that, like the chief judge of superior court, chief judge of state court, magistrate um, court, chief judge, uh, the clerk of superior magistrate court, um, they all participated in the steering committee process. Um, our former COO, Alton Adams, um, uh, guided them through that process. Um, so there was no explicit reporting requirement um, for that detailed level of information made by the board um, to the group. Uh, but the board did want to see you know, the, the results of their efforts. Um, so, you know, Mr. Alton worked with the judicial partners um, in developing the information that was reported back to the Board of Commissioners. Yeah. So you think that criminal coordinating council or whatever they're called kept data that specific as to the outcomes of the cases? I think it's, a, it's, in, it's in our justice, it's in our system and can be, can be pulled out. I don't know. I, I didn't participate in those sessions, so I don't really know what who, they did with that information. Who would you recommend me asking to pull that data out? Who should I submit a request for or ask to come testify to us? Hmm? Um, perhaps Mr. Adams, Alton, Alton He's Adams. He's no longer the COO. He is, he is um, semi-retired. Um, yeah. he, he is continuing to work with the county um, right. as a fee-based employee um, to um, help us move further down the road with the potential replacement jail project. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Adams, a fee-based employee? Does that mean he's still working just on an hourly basis? Yes, or sir. Kind of a consulting type thing? Um, project, more, more specific to the project, the jail replacement jail project. Okay, so that's the project replacement jail project? Um, yes, sir. Okay, thanks. All right, um, this might be a nice time for a little break. Would you guys uh, appreciate a, or need a little, a little bathroom break, a little stretch of legs type thing? We're going to recess for about 10, maybe 15 minutes here, and then I'll try to start wrapping some things uh, up. But I appreciate I know it's a broad range of questions, but yeah. you're helping to educate our committee. Thank you so much. Thank you. Keep everybody comfortable, and we will try to forge ahead here in, in short order. My intention always is for these meetings to last two to three hours. I think you uh, kind of lose your energy if we go much longer than that and it's such an imposition on, on you witnesses that have agreed to come so we'll try to wrap this up in about an hour or so and uh, making good progress so far I want to finish up a few of my thoughts um, sort of the traveling down certain roads and then uh, Miss Joe I want to get you to give me a little information from the county attorney's perspective if, if, so I'm happy to have you sitting there um, okay Mr. Pitts, we were talking about the special outside counsel, the approval of it, and, and the, essentially this ORCA project and, and what its goals and intents were and, and how it has successfully eliminated a lot of that backlog uh, of the criminal cases uh, that piled up during COVID. Uh, so you, as a commission, dedicated significant resources, both from the federal ARPA funds and from the county's coffers to help staff up the DA's office in order to work through that backlog of cases, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. Fair enough? Yes. Okay. And it sounds like there was some uh, accountability at least telling the reduction in the cases, right, Ms. Whitmore, from what you were telling us, they are reporting on a regular basis as the progress that was made on those cases yes sir okay maybe not as specific as I would love to see as what the disposition of the cases was uh, but we might be able to find that out through this uh, other council you got to tell me the name of it again the the judicial court system the what what was it called the it, it was the steering committee okay. for um, project orca 
and they would probably be able to give me a more thorough explanation of, of what happened to those cases. Yes, sir. So basically, we're, was the DA's office good stewards of the funds that you allocated to them to accomplish the purposes that you gave that money for? Is that fair enough to say we're trying to monitor that somehow? Through the reporting, yes, sir. Okay. You can leave that microphone instead of having back and forth it if you want to. It, it, it's habit. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, Mr. Pitts, um, I'm summarizing briefly, but it sounds like the DA has pretty wide discretion how they spend the money that you appropriate to them and uh, does not have to basically get any type of pre-approval for hiring independent special counsel to assist in the activities of the DA's office. That's correct. Okay. And doesn't have to even report back to you how the money was spent or who was hired as an independent contractor and how much they were paid. That's correct. Okay. Uh, did the previous DA seek prior approval or use this mechanism of a special prosecutors? Yeah, I don't know, did he? I can't remember, Paul. I don't recall the previous Mr. Howard. Uh, yeah, and Paul Howard was right. a DA for, what, 20 years or so, right? Quite a while. Yeah. Uh, okay. Ever have using a special prosecutor. He could have. I just don't recall. Okay. Do you? I, no, I don't. I don't recall. I, I would have to research that. Would you take a look at that? Because I haven't uncovered any use of special assistant district attorneys by the prior district attorney who was in office for a couple of decades. Uh, yeah, I believe that um, request number um, 12 at least would cover four years of Mr. Howard's yeah. tenure. All and right. it's for outside counsel um, by the office of the district attorney for from 2016 to 2020. So I think that would cover that, that item. You would be able to ascertain whether he had ever even utilized this device or this mechanism to sort of uh, bolster his manpower uh, in the DA's office. During that period of time, yes, sir. Okay. And I don't, I didn't want to be overly burdensome and ask you to go beyond four years back because I think that would capture the contrast between the two administrations. Okay. So, um, Mr. Chairman, are you satisfied with the transparency and the disclosures or the kind of keeping you in the loop by the DA's office on her use of special prosecutors? Well, I mean, that's, we've never had this situation before. Uh, I just don't recall uh, under, under her, the, her predecessor, Mr. Howard using a, uh, special prosecutor so this is sort of new territory now with outside counsel that's different because that is recommended by the county attorney on behalf of the county yes in civil matters yes okay um, but you don't have recollection in all your years of service of previous DAs uh, ever utilizing a special assistant district attorney not that I recall okay. no sir if they did it was never brought to your attention or disclosed or publicized so that you would know about it. That's correct. Okay. And I think your position is that that as a board, it's been communicated to you by the DA's office that uh, she does not need your prior approval of such uh, contracts. Well, let me make sure I understand that. She, the, the DA doesn't feel like she needs the prior approval of the county commission to hire independent contractors. Well, technically and legally, she does not with respect to special prosecutors okay. under these very, as I understand, very narrow circumstances. And I'm not sure how that's defined. Well, let me help you with that because uh, this is this process is set forth in the official code of Georgia annotated title 15-18-20. And I'll just read it into the, the record here. Under subparagraph A, the district attorney in each judicial circuit may employ such additional assistant district attorneys 
deputy district attorneys, or other attorneys, investigators, paraprofessionals, clerical assistants, victim and witness assistance personnel, and other employees or independent contractors, as may be provided for by local law, or as may be authorized by the governing authority of the county or counties comprising the judicial circuit. Now, Fulton County is a single county judicial circuit, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And so you are the governing authority as the Board of Commissioners of that county? Yes, sir. Okay. And what you're saying is, is that you have never authorized her hiring independent contractors to assist in the prosecution of her duties? That's correct. It wasn't required. Uh, well, this law requires it, but uh, you, the county did not require it? Uh, well, the distinction, again, that I make is a distinction between with outside counsel and the special prosecutor. It was always my understanding that the district attorney had, uh, had the authority uh, to hire a, a special prosecutor as he or she saw the need to do so. Yeah. And that's the position that Ms. Willis has stated to you as chairman of the commission that she was not required to get prior approval or authority to, to hire Mr. Wade or anybody else for that matter. Well, we have, have never, I didn't have a direct conversation with her about yeah. that, but it's that, that's just the, the way, way it is and the way the, our understanding was that because it's a special prosecutor, it did not have to come before the, before the, uh, the board for approval. And I was asked that question yeah. quite a bit <coughs> by the uh, members of the media. I said, did, right. did, did this have to come before the board? And in researching it, uh, we concluded that it did not. Right. I'm going to ask your county attorney to help me with that research because she and I have had conversations about any court interpretations of this statute uh, as we flesh that out. As the committee, the commission chairman, mm -hmm. would it be your preference that DA or other constitutional officers should seek your approval before hiring independent contractors that you are responsible for paying for? Yeah, that's a different. Repeat that. Let me make sure I understand you, sir. As the county commission chairman, yes, sir. would it be your preference that the district attorney did have to seek your approval before going out and hiring special prosecutors or independent contractors? If you're paying for it, or your general fund is. Well, but under the, uh, I mean, it, the, the current law, as I understand the current law, as it relates to constitutional officers and this in the in the district attorney does not fall under that like the sheriff okay. and, and the others do but sort of and she's sort of a state constitutional officer as i understand yeah. it it's so a little different part of the job of this committee is to determine whether we need to change the law if it's unclear in this case and i'm wondering if you are the lawmaker here mm -hmm. Would you like to see state law change so that a district attorney would have to ask your prior approval before going out and entering into contracts with special prosecutors? Well, probably my opinion may be a little different because I'm more, I focus on, on, on the money and I'm all, always right. want to follow the money from a fiscal conservative and like to know how the money is being spent, but with respect to a district attorney um, hiring who she or he or she believes that they need to, I mean, I don't have any issue with that, but but I would like to know how the money is being spent, so not who, but we're, how. We're back to the keeping you informed and the transparency of this process. If mm -hmm. a DA is allowed to unilaterally hire whoever, whomever they want to, at whatever price they want to pay them. Do you feel like the county government ought to be able to be kept in the loop on this and, and uh, reported to as to how your money was spent? 
Well, in the loop, yes, sir, there's no doubt about that. Okay. And you, you don't it, feel like this process has been transparent so far? Well, to the extent that we have not, re we didn't, we were not advised of uh, the hiring of, of, uh, of uh, not, and not that it was required, of a special prosecutor, nor the payment, uh, hourly rate or whatever the rate was. I mean, it would be, we were just following the law. And right. uh, obviously, I'd like to have more information, but that was the law at the time and is the law at the time, as I understand the law. In your opinion, has uh, DA Willis been forthcoming or transparent with you and the commission as to her utilization of uh, special assistant district attorney in this election integrity case? Well, to the extent that we, this is all new ground for us and for all of us. And, and that's because it wasn't utilized by the prior district attorney for the last 20 years before her election. Well, this whole issue with the with election integrity, election interference, and all of that, it's new new territory for us, and we're sort of, you know, feeling our way as we go through this. Even with the uh, trying to work down uh, the the backlog of cases that we had, so Do you we were worry sort of making up rules as we went along. To be honest with you. Sure. Do you worry that she was utilizing resources uh, for prosecuting a? a election integrity case rather than getting rid of this backlog of 40,000 40, criminal cases? Would you repeat that? Does it worry you that she was spending significant resources without prior approval or even any reporting or accountability pursuing an election integrity case rather than working on this backlog of 40,000 criminal cases that were pending in Fulton County it might have been 56,000. I can't remember all my numbers. It was a lot total. Well, as I said earlier, and as the CFO said earlier, we <coughs> appropriated 75 million of the 206 million of the ARPA money that we received to the justice justice system. Um, and she had, in addition to in addition to the the, the backlogs. She is currently involved with uh, the YSL case and the election uh, interference case. So those were, I mean, three really unusual cases uh, um, that um, I had never experienced before. So we were trying to be as helpful to her as we can and could by providing, for the most part, the resources that she asked. But as far as what happened to the resources, the money, when I say resources, I mean the money that we uh, gave her, or her, her uh, uh, we, after it was given to her, we tracked the, the cases, the, uh, the, the backlogs, um, and we'll, <laughs> the jury is still out on the YSL and the election interference, so we'll get it all come out in the wash, I suppose, as to how effective it's all been. And when but you we provided what was asked for, and we've not asked for uh, not asked for, nor have we been provided any interim reports as to well, how, how are we proceeding other than with the, the, the backlogs. So she hadn't really told you how she spent the money? No, sir. Okay, so you gave her $75 million plus at least another well, it $5 It wasn't million. just to her, there was a whole justice system at right. $75 million. Right? That's yeah, correct. Yeah, it wasn't right. just to her. Right. You gave her many millions of dollars to get caught up on a backlog of criminal prosecutions. Yes. Okay. And when you did that, there was no mention of any election integrity case, was there? That didn't really ever come up specifically. Just this one uh, sounding for additional money in 2023. I believe that's correct. When you say that's is, correct. Yeah, the 1.1 million for Tex MacGyver and public <laughs> corruption mm -hmm. is the only thing that could specifically have referenced an election integrity case. In, in her enhancement request, yes, right. sir. And it wasn't in her budgetary request either, was it? Anything about election integrity? It, it would have, if it was for additional resources, it would have come through as an enhancement request. 
so as a commission you weren't aware that you were funding a uh, election interference case certainly not before 2023 which would have been three years after the election that's I think that's what, correct okay and you haven't been given any information to tell you where the money that you did give her through orca funds or other things were spent well whatever she whatever whatever part of that 75 million that she received and, and whether what, what how much was used for the backlog how much was used for the the YSL case and how much was used for the election interference case and we don't know yeah and we're not being given any information other than with the backlog now that's that that's probably easier to quantify I don't know how she would give us or, or any district attorney for that matter would give us a, um, a report on how a the case is going until it's concluded understood yeah. but she could have told you how your money was being spent that you had awarded to her whether it was being spent on the backlog of cases versus public corruption cases versus you know Tex McIver or whoever she she would have been able to give you that data could have yes sir. but she didn't did not and we didn't ask either okay and that's partly because she's taken this stance that she's a constitutional officer and doesn't have to give you that information uh, that's probably a correct statement okay well, let me let me turn to you miss Joe um, you and I have had conversations before today about whether or not a district attorney has to get prior approval and authorization of funding from the County Commission when utilizing this uh, independent contractor uh, special prosecutor device that the legislature gave the ability through title 15-18-20a you heard me read that relevant portions of the statute and you would agree just at face value that would seem to require a DA to obtain approval from the governing authority before hiring an independent contractor yes sir okay but I think uh, I'll make I, sure you're you're on. I would um, agree that the plain language of the statute certainly seems to indicate that um, the governing authority needs to be consulted and approve such an appointment. Right, now, uh, the, so you're the tell tell us who you are. You're the county oh, attorney. Give me just a little bit of background on you. My name is Sue Joe, and I am the county attorney for Fulton County. Okay. Um, which means that I am the uh, essentially in-house general counsel for the corporation that is Fulton County and my office handles civil matters for the entire county um, provides defense and legal advice and and counsel to the Board of Commissioners and in your role as county attorney were you ever asked to interpret this statute or do legal research to find out whether or not Miss Willis should have gotten prior approval or whether she was required to do that before going out and hiring independent counsel I don't recall if there was a specific request but of course I keep up with current events and when mm -hmm. this issue came up I did have the occasion to um, look into the matter and research it give us your legal opinion as to whether or not prior approval is required we've you've agreed that the plain language of the statute would indicate that have there been judicial interpretations of this statute that that uh, cloud those matters so um, let me begin by saying that the statute uh, OCJ 15-18-20 that you are reading from um, deals with uh, assistant district attorneys so it's not explicitly giving the DA permission to appoint special district um, assistant district attorneys in case law that statute it does has say been, independent contractors though, right? it does okay. which which we um, that is the the classification for uh, special prosecutors in Fulton County right. in terms of, of how um, how they are employed is there another statute that specifically addresses special independent counsel or prosecutors whatever I, the I have not found one and what I was um, going to say is that the case law that I have uh, reviewed that has interpreted this statute says that while it is not explicitly um, mentioning special uh, assistant district attorneys that that is included in the general authority provided under the statute to district attorneys so in at least three uh, Georgia Court of Appeal cases 
what I have found is that the court has rejected the proposition that this particular statute requires a district attorney to obtain explicit permission from a county prior to appointing a special assistant district attorney. And in fact, the original case, um, the, ca the court noted that. Uh, give, us that cit give us that citation, because so this that is kind of instructive of to the legislature. Do we need to amend clarify. this statute to clarify? Uh, and so you're, you help me with my legal research. What's that citation? So I, I, I'm sure the Attorney General's office would be happy to, uh, <laughs> to um, provide their uh, official advice. But what, what I will, uh, I'll begin by just saying um, what the citations are of the three cases that I reviewed. One of them is Greater Georgia Amusements at 317 Georgia Appeals 116 which cites to State versus Cook at 172 Georgia Appeals 433 and is uh, referenced again in Amusement Sales Incorporated um, versus State of Georgia. And if you'll excuse me, let me look at my Westlaw. <laughs> okay, that's going to be at... Three sixteen Georgia Appeals seven twenty seven, and all of them include a construction of OCGA fifteen eighteen twenty um, that indicates the the DA does not ha a DA does not have to have explicit permission from the county in order to appoint a special assistant district attorney, and that. The employment may be pursuant to whatever private arrangements regarding compensation are mutually agreeable to the district attorney and the appointee. That is a uh, quote from State versus Cook that is contained in Greater Georgia Amusements. Okay. So, so judicial interpretation of our statute essentially eviscerate the plain meaning or language of the statute. Um, well, I will say I was definitely surprised at the construction in that it seems to be at odds with the plain language of the statute, but that is the current state of, of Georgia law as I, as far as I can find it. Okay. And in your role as county attorney, do you seek approval from the Board of Commissioners for hiring, we'll just call them outside counsel to represent the county's interest in certain civil matters? Absolutely. Um, that is considered that that travels under a separate ordinance uh, regarding the higher the engagement of outside counsel. So, for example, it could be um, an official of the county is sued, requests representation. If there is some reason why my office doesn't have the capacity um, to take it on directly, I may recommend the engagement of outside counsel, and I will bring that to the board of commissioners for their approval. Okay. And uh, that's pursuant to a county ordinance that requires that type of approval of, of both funneled through your office and submitted to the county commission? Yes, sir. The um, Fulton County Plan of Defense governs what types of circumstances in which we can provide uh, defense as a county and also the way in which that provision is made. It is either made through my office or through outside counsel. Even if it is provided through my office, I still go to the Board of Commissioners, present the case, indicate why it's covered under the plan of defense, and ask for authority to, to represent. Is there a similar county ordinance that the references or applies to uh, prosecutors? There is not. Okay. So you only refer back to the state law for that? Yes. Okay. In your role as county attorney, do you are you responsible for re responding to open records requests? Yes. The um, custodian of records was established in recent years and centralized as an individual who's designated from among the, the attorneys in my office. So that is an attorney that responds to those complaints? 
it is an attorney who oversees the yeah. the response operation. Do you, does uh, so that's under the control of your office then, or the coordinate the, the intake and coordination of the response is within my office, the county attorney's office. Um, obviously, we are not the custodians of most of the documents that are requested, so we have to coordinate that. Excuse me, <clears throat> with um, designated open records liaison within each custodial department. Do you, uh, in your office, respond to open records requests submitted to the district attorney's office? Um, she has the ability to uh, handle the entire open records process separately from the county as a state official. Um, historically, the district attorney's office has both utilized my office as the point of origin and liaison, um, and then at times has chosen to opt out of that. Currently, uh, this district attorney for Fulton County um, does receive her uh, Open Records Act request through the Open Records custodian in my office. And if counsel is needed to respond to those requests or object to them or litigate disputes over Open Records requests, is that something provided by you? for the district attorney or does she handle that herself? So having it routed through my office is a fairly um, recent uh, circumstance with our district attorney's office, but now that it is within my office, um, any questions as to exemptions and what is subject to public disclosure under the Open Records Act uh, would be referred to my attorneys in my office and we would assist with that and provide guidance. And is your office actively providing guidance or, or legal counsel to the DA's office in any open records request or litigation arising from those at this time? At this time, yes. Okay. Um, does she opt out of utilizing your services on occasion? Handle them in-house, so, so to speak? I, I did not mean to uh, imply that it was a case-by-case -case basis. There was a period of time in which um, the point of contact was not my office. My office was not involved in the process. But as of, I would have to check to confirm when, but it would be at least several months ago, perhaps a bit longer. Um, she has uh, opted to utilize my office as the initial point of contact and to provide that type of guidance again. Was she using your office uh, for a point of contacts and guidance and uh, sort of legal services during the open records requests that Ashley Merchant submitted this past fall? Um, I would have to confirm that. I don't know exactly when that came in. Okay. But here in the last few months, uh, District Attorney Willis has begun to, to utilize your office as the point of contact for receiving open records requests and for responding to them? Um, that's not exactly accurate. For receiving and for coordinating and providing advice, but um, in many instances the uh, custodial departments will upload their own responsive documents. So when we advise them of what is being requested, provide any legal guidance that may be necessary, um, our point of contact for communication to provide status updates uh, to the requesting party. But because the custodial department may have uh, more immediate access, or if it is in the case of voluminous uh, responsive documents or documents with restricted access within those departments, the department itself is often the, um, the ones who will upload the documents into our software uh, that is used for Open Records Act requests. So if I submit tomorrow and opens records request to the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Maybe I want to find out what happened to those 16,000 cases that ORCA was supposedly funding. Who will respond to that? 
Does um, the DA's office respond to me, or do they route it through you and you give me a response? My expectation would be that someone on the open records team in my office would be the initial point of contact and say, thank you for your request. We understand you've requested X, Y, Z documents. Um, you know, either here are your documents, or uh, we, we estimate that it will take a certain amount of time to gather the documents that we believe are responsive and within our custody. Um, and then that they would keep you updated or be available should you call in or email in with a question as to status. And if the district attorney did not want to provide the documentation I uh, requested, would she object to that, instruct you to object to that, or does your office make that determination? So I don't know that we have a long enough history to have a representative sampling of all the different potential circumstances, but my expectation um, of the process would be that we would communicate what was um, requested, that her office would identify whether or not they had responsive documents, and that they would work with my office to identify the subset of those documents that do not fall under any type of exemption, for example, um, pending investigations or any of the statutory exemptions that are provided for in state law. Okay. And so what happens if she says, I ain't giving that information up? I am not aware of such a circumstance. In some instances, the response we, we get from the departments may include, we do not have any responsive documents. And that is how sometimes um, disputes arise because uh, the requesting party may believe that, th that they exist and the custodial department um, asserts that they do not exist. Okay, what if they say, yep, they exist, but nope, I'm not giving them to you? Uh, that, you know they exist, your custodial people figured it out, it's public records. To my knowledge, that response has not occurred. Um, but if it did, I would expect my open records team to review um, the statutory obligations under the Open Records Act with the custodial department to um, emphasize and impress upon them their legal obligation to provide uh, the documents that are subject to the Open Records Act. Okay. Thank you. Let me ask you about the county uh, ordinance concerning reporting of gifts from vendors or independent contractors. Does Fulton County have such a policy? I believe, and I haven't reviewed that specifically for today, but I believe you are referring to the prohibitions that are contained in our ethics code? Yes. So yes. What, we, what does your ethics code of Fulton County provide as far as the receipt of gifts from independent contractors or other vendors of the county or its agencies? Um, I mean, it, if I could have a moment, I could try to pull that up, but just off the top of my head from previous reviews, uh, it, there's a lot of language in our ethics code about appearance of impropriety, appearance of conflicts, avoiding appearance of conflicts. So my advice, if I were asked, would always be to avoid it altogether. However, there are certain customary gifts, chocolates at Christmas time, Christmas gifts, etc., things that are shared among everyone in the office. Um, as long as it's of nominal value, and I believe the cutoff is $100. Um, it, there, there is there is a nominal value that is allowed under our ethics code, but anything of significance beyond that is considered to be prohibited. And is it prohibited to receive it, or are you required to report it? I can't recall if it's a report. I want to say it's a reporting requirement, and the reason I can't recall is because I like to stay as far away from the line as possible, so my preference would be to not receive it, um, but it, it may be a reporting requirement. If, if you would like a certain answer, I can um, check either on a break sure. or at some, some point in the proceedings. I'll let you do that for me. Um, do you believe that ethics code applies uh, to the district attorney or other constitutional officers of Fulton County? I, I'm not sure what the intent was when the code was um, originally enacted. 
but I know that there has been uh, a determination by the Board of Ethics which has purview over adjudicating matters um, relating to the ethics code that it does not apply to the district attorney um, and uh, in a related uh, occurrence we have had a recent piece of legislation um, updating the ethics code uh, in Fulton County to add um, I believe the amendment is a sentence that specifically indicates that the ethics code applies to all elected officials in Fulton County. Do you know why? Why, why this clarification? I, I did not, I was not the sponsor of the legislation, so I cannot speak for the commissioner who sponsored it. Um, but I do know that it was subsequent in time to the decision of the ethics board that the district attorney was not covered by our code of ethics. So there was an ethics complaint brought about the receipt of gifts and it was determined that your existing ordinance or code, ethics code, did not apply. Yes, sir. The board of that. ethics determined that it did not have jurisdiction under the current ethics code. And the county commission has subsequently here in recent months amended that ethics code to make it clear that it does apply to constitutional officers such as the DA and the sheriff and the tax commissioner yes I believe that was passed on April 17th or thereabouts yeah, very recently <clears throat> Hi, uh, mr. chairman tell us about that well I, mean, I can't add anything to what the county attorney has said it, it came about and I supported it when it came up right. to there's some loopholes so we're trying to close all loopholes yeah. is it your and so that is now has been enacted a recent ordinance or ethics code for the county yes sir and it now does require the district attorney and other constitutional officers to disclose gifts of more than a nominal amount i think that's how it's worded okay but it covers the district attorney and others all elected officials right what about reporting of gifts that are uh, above a hundred dollars or a nominal amount are you required to report those or simply banned from receiving them I'd have to check the, the exact language in the code yeah. Sue will be looking yeah. while we talk so just on a sort of philosophical um, level yes sir. why do you feel like that was needed or, or, or that type of ban is appropriate for elected officials including constitutional officers well, I wasn't the sponsor of the legislation, right. but but you the, voted for it. Or I voted for it. Yeah, to cover to, to close any loopholes or remove any doubt as to you know who's covered, who's not covered, because the idea is for us to be open and transparent about what we're doing. Okay. And is there an appearance of impropriety if you were to receive kickbacks or things of benefit from folks that you that were contractors or vendors of the county? Okay, repeat that one. Is there an appearance of impropriety or wrongdoing for elected officials to receive kickbacks or uh, things of benefit from vendors or independent contractors of the county? Well, I would say if it's over uh, whatever that amount is, then it, that would be a problem. Okay. And is the reason is that your independent judgment and acting on behalf of the people brought into question if you're receiving things of benefit from those that you're doing business with well I mean we want to be above reproach I guess that's used quite a bit by elected officials and, and I get that's the intent to, yeah. to, that, so that we are above reproach and that we are open and fair in our dealings uh, and we have blackout periods where we can't even uh, cannot even contact to those who are seeking to do business with the county even though it was recently determined that the ethics provisions did not apply to constitutional officers, did uh, DA Willis fill those type of disclosure forms out, those gift forms in the past? I'm not aware of it. I don't know about that. Okay. I've not seen. Um, what about any uh, Paul Howard? Did he fill those type of forms out in the past? You have no knowledge of that. Yeah. Yes, he wasn't using independent contractors anyway, right? Uh, I don't recall him using uh, the special prosecutor, uh, so, so I'm not aware. Has the county? But I have not reviewed what other elected officials are, you know, reporting. Has the county commission ever come in and ask any um, 
agency heads or constitutional officers to terminate or void or uh, alter any contracts with independent contractors or vendors? Okay, repeat the question. Has the county commission ever come in and asked for department heads or constitutional officers to terminate or void or amend or change any contracts that they might have entered into with independent contractors or outside vendors? Because a recent contract, uh, not <clears throat> excuse me, not involving the um, not involving the district attorney, but um, we didn't ask the uh, department head to. We did not ask the department head to terminate the contract. We simply uh, terminated the funding of the contract, and the effect of that was to terminate the contract. And in Ms. Willis's case, you wouldn't have been able to terminate her contract with Mr. Wade because you can't control the funding of that? All right, let me make sure I understand the question. So Ms. Wade had a contract with Mr. Wade to be special prosecutor as an independent contractor. And you have not asked her to terminate that agreement. The judge ultimately did, but but a county commission never. The board did not. Okay. No, sir. Uh, and was that because you approved of that arrangement, or because you didn't think you had the authority to require her to terminate that arrangement? Because we did not have the authority. Because she had the authority to hire the uh, special prosecutor. When did that first come to your attention? the board's attention that she had entered into a contract for a special prosecutor, Mr. Wade, to handle this election integrity case? Me personally? Yeah. During the media coverage on it. So you didn't even know it until the media erupted back in the fall sometime? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, what was your response or your reaction, both personally as in your capacity as chairman of the commission? Well, since we had, we believe that we did not have uh, any control over her decisions, that it was her decision to hire the special prosecutor, that we had no role in it. Could you have cut the funding off for that, just like you did this other contract recently? We didn't know anything about it. Is it, it had not even been disclosed to you as a commission? No, sir. Okay. What are your views on the propriety of a elected official hiring somebody under an independent contract arrangement that they had an intimate personal relationship with? Well, you're my personal views on, yeah. I think I, I believe our new, our revised code of ethics covers a situation like that. It's been amended. Is that correct? The revised Reason. code that you support pro would prohibit that, right? Yes. Okay. It was the definition. I think was expanded to include uh, personal relationships. Yeah. Mr. Joe, can you elucidate us any on this? You you uh, you're leaning forward in your seat as if you might have some information for me there. I, I did not intend to lean forward like that. <laughs> Be careful, I'm watching. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to speak for the chairman, but I believe the recent enactment that he is referring to is a new anti-nepotism policy right. that would mm -hmm. cover personal relationships of this nature between um, an official and an independent contractor. Okay. That's, is that a new ordinance as well? 
it has is, that been there? It is. Uh, our, our prior ordinance was located within the Civil Service Act, so it was limited in its application to employees and would not have applied to independent contractors. Right. Would, it have implied, would it have applied to employees of the DA's office? Yes. Okay. So if Mr. Wade had been hired as, as an assistant DA, it would have violated the then existing nepotism policy? Assuming that they had that type of relationship, yes. Okay. Um, I think that's been admitted by both parties at this point, right? You keep up with the press, correct? I mean, yes, but in our hypothetical, I mean, it, it depends on the timing. Yeah. Um, so the amendment was to expand on your existing anti-nepotism clause that would prohibit uh, superior from having a relationship, an uh, intimate relationship with an employee to include independent contractors in that ban? In effect, yes, okay. it expands it, but it, it had to do it through a separate policy because the original policy is within our Civil Service Act and therefore limited in application to employees. So there is a separate policy that is a county-wide application that prohibits all of the same things that also applies to independent contractors because it is not limited by the scope of the Civil Service Act. And that was enacted when? I believe that would also be uh, April. Right. Was it yeah. April? April, so both April of these, 17th as well. Both of these, your ethics policies, your anti-nepotism, your gift. Have recently yes. been expanded. All right. And they were expanded to, to capture this type of situation that we're dealing with here with Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade. Had they been in place, both would have captured this, would have applied in this instance. Okay. And was there any rationale for not including independent contractors in the past, or was that just an oversight? Um, that is, that is an, well, I will say these are all uh, fairly well-established older policies, but as to the anti-nepotism policy specifically, I think the limitation is simply where it, where it was located, which is the Civil Service Act. And then because it was located in that act, it was not deemed It could to not apply. apply to anyone but employees. Okay. Do you know whether the uh, district attorney's office has a separate um, sort of ethics uh, guideline or ordinance or rules? Uh, I'm not aware. I presume there are state guidelines that would apply as a, being a state officer, but I'm not aware of any that are specific to her office. Okay. One of the things that was brought forward in one of our previous hearings is that Ms. Willis entered into an independent contract for a, essentially a publicist, a PR firm to uh, help guide and monitor uh, publicity. Uh, is that the type of contract that the county would need to approve or fund? I'm not aware of that contract, but it would... Again, if it, back to this constitutional officer and her being somewhat of a constitutional officer. I mean, there's a sheriff, the tax commission, and a couple of others that are a little different from, from the district attorney. But if she had, um, and your question is about the district attorney, yeah. if she had the funds in her budget, then she could, without coming to us, coming back to the board seeking approval. Did she ever ask uh, for funding for a PR firm out of New York City and her uh, different budget request? Is that in anything in the line item, Ms. Whitmore? She was asking for 36 million. She explained part of it would be spent for a New York City PR firm to monitor her publicity. Not that I recall. I would have to research that. Mr. Chairman, is that something that the Board of Commissioners would ordinarily approve or budget for for various departments? Well, again, if, if that's not something that we would 
as a matter of course, routinely uh, be aware of. Uh, and I can't recall uh, ever of a request like that coming before the board. But if it's in a department's budget, particularly a constitutional officer's budget, and he or she feels that that's what they need, then if they have the funds uh, under this umbrella of, uh, right. of a constitutional officer, they can do it. But you're the one that has to approve those funds because I can assure you that's not in our state budget. Well, We don't give we don't, PR money to DA's offices. Uh, we wouldn't be funding that specific line item. <clears throat> we would be funding whatever she had requested. Then once the, once the, once the money is approved, then um, the constitutional officer once the constitutional officer's budget has been approved, they can make changes as they deem appropriate. Does your board of commissioners have a contract with any type of media monitoring service or public relations service? Does the board of commissioners? Yes, sir. As a board, uh, no, sir. Okay. Would you approve that type of funding if she had specifically requested it? Would the board have? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't speak for the entire board, but knowing the board as I do, probably not. For that, for the purpose that you've outlined, probably yeah. not. Okay. Um, you learned, I guess, the same way the rest of us did back in the fall, as the essentially the the media reported this relationship uh, between Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade. Uh, what type of pressure was put on the Board of Commissioners, or was it uh, anybody complained to you, or was it frustrating that you couldn't do anything about I just, I'm curious what the reaction was uh, from the Board uh, when all this scandal erupted. Well, there's no pressure on the board per se. I mean, uh, individual constituents, you know, may have commented, you know, here and there, but there's no, um, I didn't feel any, any pressure. Uh, obviously, people would comment on what they had seen or heard or read, and I'm sure that's true for the rest of the board as well, but no, no, no pressure. Yeah. You've kind of explained here today that uh, the board really has no supervisory authority uh, or control over how Ms. Willis spends the dollars that you budget for her, but the public is um, had the presumption until you're clarifying it here now that the board approved this device of using an independent contractor as a special prosecutor. It helped fund this election integrity case and a number of attorneys, both private contractors and you know assistant DAs being engaged in it and endorsed or, you know, didn't disapprove of the relationship between Mr. Wade uh, and Ms. Willis. It, what is your reaction or response to that? Just kind of like you told us today that that's, that's out of your control. You may not approve it, but can't stop it or prevent it. Well, you just said a lot now, and, yeah. and I can't, I can't, <laughs> I'm not sorry, I can't follow all of that. All right. uh, okay. So if you could repeat, I mean, the last... Maybe I can break it down. I just, yes, sir. Um, do you feel like the Fulton County Board of Commissioners uh, supported this election integrity case or 16 cases, either by financially supporting her to pursue those cases? Well, I think they... I don't think the board... Uh, we, the board had no position or has no position on it. Um, the district attorney, as I understand uh, how district attorneys operate, they are free to choose the cases that they get involved in. Okay. And we as a board uh, have no input into that. You were never educated about that before the fact? About? About her, those prosecutions. Election integrity cases. I mean, did, did the was the board informed that yeah. the district attorney was going to? You've made it clear she didn't specifically ask for funding for that prosecution, mm -hmm. or for the hiring of special 
assistant district attorneys to lead that prosecution did you That's even right. know that was happening and that you were funding that even if it was in the big chunk of money no we're not we're not advised of uh, of her work program if you will i mean right. we 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 provide funding for her and um she sets her own work program, and I think that's probably true for, as I understand it, for all district attorneys. Okay. There was testimony um, before us in previous meetings about uh, Ms. Willis and, and Mr. Wade making trips to Washington, D.C. to meet with the Justice Department and, and Ms. Willis's part, I think, meeting with the Vice President of the United States. Does, uh, I guess this may not be best for you, but I guess, Ms. Whitmore, were you aware of any expenditures for that? I mean, that was paid for with taxpayer money. Is that something that's reported? Are you track that they're spending your general funds to travel and meet with the vice president and the Justice Department? <clears throat> we do record their um, travel expenses. Um, I was not and have not reviewed the district attorney's um, office travel, um, the details. So I, I had no knowledge of what her individual, you know, travel arrangements would have been, but their um, uh, travel requests and transactions um, are, uh, if they're paid for out of county resources, there is a reconciliation process that is undertaken by the, um, the traveler. If they're using the county's procurement card or travel card to pay for the travel, um, you know, then there is a detailed process that they, they have to, to go through for that. Um, but I'm, at, at my level, I'm not necessarily involved in, in looking at or reviewing any of those transactions. Those type of travel expenses, do they require any prior approval by the county? or by your office? Our travel policy allows the elected officials to approve the travel for their staff and to approve the travel for themselves. And you mentioned the procurement card. Is that what we call a P card? Um, yes, sir. Uh, we use both a uh, P card for non-travel related um, credit card purchases, and then we have a separate card that we call a T card, T for travel. Ah, um, so departments have both one for basically goods and services and one that is for, for travel. So the county's policy um, is, a, is a reimbursement based policy, so the traveler can pay for their um, travel expenses directly and seek reimbursement, or the county will prepay um, using the T card, and then the uh, reconciliation process follows the um, the trip. Explain that reconciliation process. Let's say somebody uses a T card to take a trip to California or whatever. It gets charged directly to the county through that essentially credit card. Yes, every department has a single <coughs> travel card holder. Okay. Um, and uh, the individual traveler is required to coordinate their travel needs with um, the travel card holder. Travel card, ho travel card holder makes all of the um, uh, arrangements and charges for that card. And the traveler, um, if they're traveling for official county business, is expected to return and supply um, uh, through uh, Concur, we use the Concur platform for our uh, travel reconciliation process. They're expected to um, provide um, the receipts, the hotel um, uh, evidence, if it was a conference, evidence that they attended the conference, um, and um, any other uh, receipts that they may have uh, where they are seeking um, reimbursement. So that is when I refer to the reconciliation process, um, that is what I'm referring to from the traveler's perspective. And then each month, the uh, travel card holder um, is required to pull their um, bank statement for the card and complete the reconciliation process for that um, bank statement for that period so that we can um, process payment to the financial institution that we use for our um, credit card purposes. 
So is Miss Willis the T card holder for the district attorney's office? I, I don't believe she is, no, sir. Okay. So it would be some designated employee of the DA's office would handle that? Yes, sir. And at the reconciliation stage each month, they would submit the receipts from each member of that agency or department that had utilized the card? For the charges, that they, would, they would need to submit the requested documentation um, for the charges on the card for that statement. Okay. Are there limits as to say, you know, could you put somebody up in a Rich Carlton versus a Holiday Inn? Are there caps on how much you're allowed to spend on so, so lodging our, or travel? Um, our, our policy does outline um, those, those type of limitations, yes, sir. And if somebody exceeds those limitations, do you simply cut the reimbursement off at whatever your cap is or your guideline calls for? If they have requested um, an exception, so say they're traveling to um, an area and there are no um, hotels available, it's a conference, there are no hotels available at the um, host hotel and they have to move to a different location um, and the rates are higher, they can ask for an exception to that um, and seek approval for that. Um, but, but otherwise, they may be charged back for um, those costs that are outside of the allowance, uh, allowances allowed through the travel policy. Does the department have, head have the power to override those uh, allowances? create exceptions as I think you said exceptions uh, are um, uh, required to be approved um, in advance and by um, the county manager or his designee okay. do these rules that you've just outlined apply to the district attorney's office um, these rules apply to anyone who travels um, using the county's um, uh, seeking reimbursement from the county using the county's travel policy or the county's T card. Who is the custodian of these documents, uh, the reconciliation process and the payments made under the various T cards and P cards? Uh, the purchasing department is um, the administrator of the um, T card and P card program. Um, ultimately, the final reconciliation. Um, packages are um, received and retained by the finance department. Are they under your purview? Um, both of those are, yes, sir. Okay. So you could get me that information if I properly requested it? Yes, sir. Mr. Pitts, you are on the audit committee of the commission? Yes, sir. Is that by virtue of your position as the commission chairman, or is it a, a subset of the commission? How's that created? Uh, let's see. I get two, it's a one, two, five member committee, I believe, and two commissioners sit on that committee and they're appointed or nom well, nominated and appointed by the board. And currently you are on the audit committee? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and is Bob Ellis the other commissioner? Yes. Right. Commissioner Ellis is chair of the audit committee. And who would the other three members be then if, if you are the two commissioners? The uh, private citizens. Right. And what's the authority or the power of that audit committee? What's the role of the audit committee? Well, we we work with the uh, county auditor mr anthony nix and to uh, provide audits for various departments areas when we see or feel that uh, need to be looked into from an audit point of view whether it's financial or programmatic or otherwise i know only what i've read in the atlanta journal constitution about this but apparently there was a recent audit report that had been requested by the audit committee Yes, sir. Tell me about that. What was that uh, audit for? I believe you're referring to the audit <coughs> that was done at the request of the audit committee 
uh, we utilize a, 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 an outside firm called Cherry, Cherry Becker, a nationally recognized firm, uh, to look at uh, and review our, and it wasn't really an audit, it was a review of our purchasing, primarily purchasing uh, requirements and processes within the county and looking at all departments, but uh, focused in on the sheriff's department and the district attorney's office in particular. Okay. And um, did that Cherry Beckert, is that Beckert, how you, yes, sir. Did it produce a written audit report of its work? It did. Okay. And was that presented to the commission? Yes. Or just to your committee? No, no, it was, it was presented to the commission and we had two representatives from the firm uh, make a presentation to the full board a couple of meetings ago, maybe three meetings ago. Did this audit uh, reflect any irregularities or improprieties in spending by the sheriff's department? There were, I'm going from memory, we can make the full report uh, audit well it, it was really a review and not an audit but it was an audit firm nationally recognized firm and again we f they focused on the sheriff's department and the district attorney and there were two sets of uh, recommendations and I don't recall the specific recommendations but with uh, with respect to the sheriff I think they use a term of do you remember the term? Was it high? Mm -hmm. High problem. Is that it? Yeah. So the conclusion was the uh, the county sheriff's office risk level they call it was high, and it lists certain areas. And with respect to the district attorney, the risk level was medium. Did it list particular areas that there was a medium risk for impropriety by the district attorney's office? Well, I can read from the document here. Uh, the use of prosecutorial discretion as a justification comes with the risk of it being used with greater frequency with more purchases being made over time outside of county rules and procedures. And that expenditures that we're talking about? Purchases. Okay. Are those yeah. purchases using a P card or a T card or this is it identified? Uh, probably a combination of both. Okay. Ms. Whitmore. Prosecute Prosecutorial discretion are typically the items that the district attorney um, engages in directly. Um, uh, expert witnesses, um, if there's any special evidence processing that has to take place, um, uh, any visual aids maybe that need to be supplied as part of trial any extraordinary trial expenses typically uh, the district attorney uh, engages and secures those goods and services outside of our county procurement process um, which is the reference to the prosecutorial um, uh, prosecutorial discretion I think is the word that they use mm -hmm. That's Would that include travel <coughs> expenses for witnesses being brought in from out of state? Those should those should be following the county's travel policy. It it does have a section that deals with um, um, extradition and and um, witnesses. Again, but it applies if you're using the um, paying for it with county resources, seeking reimbursement, or using the county's um, travel card. Would that include? Uh, special prosecutors, independent contractor prosecutors? The DA's use of prosecutor, prosecutorial um, discretion, yes. So that, that's captured by this category that yes. the audit report is saying yes, sir. you got some moderate potential for abuse here. Did they specify any particular 
expenses that seem to be inappropriate in this report or this review? Probably in the larger report, there were some instances, but I'll have to provide that to you because that's not a, in this document that I'm looking at now. Okay. Ms. Whitmore, have you provided that document? You've given me a notice, a book full of things. I don't know how much made it to it yet, but you're still in progress. Um, I, I, I have not. The subpoena asked for um, uh, audit, audits. Um, you don't consider this an audit and this is just a review? Yeah, it was a review, so I, I did not um, I did not include it. But Could it, you uh, voluntarily provide me a copy of that report that you have as well as the full report, this review? Sue, um, is that sufficient? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Noting it now. I'm sorry, Will. I appreciate that. Um, There were a number of references to Ms. Willis having uh, significant expenditures for her personal security detail. Is that something that was presented to you in a budget request? So repeat that one, sir. There has been testimony before the committee about mm -hmm. uh, the, the district attorney, Ms. Willis, having significant expenditures for a personal security detail that may even travel with her on these uh, trips that she takes. Is that something that was presented to the commission as a part of a budget request, the cost of, of that? I don't know the whether or not, as a matter of course, the district attorney has a um, security de detail. I don't know the answer to that. Did Mr. Howard ever have a security detail? I know that he had, uh, we had some, secu some security enhancements around his home at one point because of some threats that he received. Okay. Now, with respect to District Attorney Willis, again, I don't know whether she routinely had a uh, security detail or whether we paid for one, but in this particular instance, because of the YSL trial in particular, and the what does YSL stand for? Young Slime Life, I believe. Isn't that okay, correct? That so right? that's the Young Slime okay. Life. That's the the gang-related prosecution's been going on for a year now. Yes. Okay, got it. Because of that trial and the election interference. Um, it was came. It came to us in executive session that um, she was receiving, uh, as were as as it were a number of us, uh, me included, yeah. uh, 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 particularly during the election back in 2020. I had a detail with me, but because of the YSL trial and the uh, election interference, she was receiving uh, threats, bodily harm, pretty serious. So a report was made to us about that in executive <laughs> session, and a request came uh, to us on her behalf to provide uh, additional security for her. And after listening to what was going on, uh, we, the board, uh, listened and then in open session uh, decided and voted to provide additional uh, security for her what's the cost been for that additional security and is it continuing up until today I uh, don't know whether it's continuing but do you have the cost from the security as I recall the the full ask that was presented included relocation um, as well as some hardening of her personal residence um, and uh, um, law enforcement support from um, at least two outside jurisdictions. Um, I don't recall what all of the amounts were, um, nor can I tell you that I have seen um, an invoice from either of those other external um, uh, jurisdictions 
um, the, rele the, the relocation um, costs um, run about $4,000 a month. Was that relocation cost renting her this condominium where she and Mr. Wade would meet? I don't know the physical address of either of those locations, so I really wouldn't be able to answer that question. Do you know who you were making the payments to for this, uh, for the rent? Um, we do. I do not, um, but I certainly know who we cut a check. Well, I, I know how to obtain who we cut a check to, okay. um, but I, I don't see those um, expenses every month. The, has that continued, the, the relocation expense? I mean, essentially, the county is providing extra security at her personal home, but also renting her a separate location she can live in or sleep at. And I, I'm not going to ask you to disclose that location. I'm just, is that continuing? The expenses are continuing. And how long have they been going on? I believe they began in the later portion of 2022. Um, I don't recall the exact date. I would have to, to research that. All right. Thank you. Ms. Joe, um, you had mentioned this, I don't know if I'm calling it a civil rights office, but what, what, what is the county's structure for uh, receiving complaints of employment discrimination against the county or any agency of it? So employees who have uh, complaints regarding their employment conditions have um, a couple of different possible routes. One of them is DCRC, and I now I am blanking on what the acronym stands for, but I think it's the... Diversity and Civil Rights Compliance. Okay, so it is... We've Diversity kind of, and Civil Rights Compliance. Yes, we've kind of outsourced our initial point of contact for EEOC-type violations internally. Um, and that is done outside of my office. Uh, and then at some point in the process, we may get involved later on down the road. But it begins um, at DCRC. And then we also have a whistleblower hotline that is established that routes to our county auditor. And whistleblower complaints can be investigated in that manner as well. So are those are the two by prim the auditor primary or routes. DCRA? DCRC. Or DCRC. Is that a confidential process? Uh, I would say so. It is confidential even from me at the outset unless it develops into litigation or an EEOC complaint. So it should be confidential from the employee's point of view when they okay. present the, con uh, the complaint. Does the employee's employer learn of such a complaint? Some um, type of employment violation? I. I Employer, meaning their manager or whoever yeah. they are, the subject of their complaint. Right. Um, I would not expect that person to be made aware uh, unless and until there's a point in the investigation where that becomes necessary in order to obtain necessary information. Like their explanation or defense. Yes, yeah. uh, when they would be made aware of the complaint in order to provide a response. Okay. And as, insofar as the whistleblower hotline and that's confidential as well I would presume um, yes under state whistleblower laws the identity of the whistleblower is kept confidential for as long as possible and does the county have its own whistleblower policy uh, the county does also have a whistleblower policy is that a written policy um, I have not looked at it in probably over a decade wow. <laughs> I believe it's an ordinance that mirrors the state whistleblower uh, statute, but I would have to confirm that. Does it prohibit retaliation against somebody for bringing forth a complaint of impropriety or wrongdoing? Yeah, I, I would expect that it does include that because if it mirrors the statute, then it would include the anti-retaliation provisions. So how long have you been with the county attorney's office? So, um, two and a half years as the county attorney, and then 10 years prior to coming back as the county attorney, I was a line attorney in the office for four years. So, okay. What do you make of this uh, 
constitutional officer argument, so to speak, that constitutional officers are not uh, subject to any supervision or control by the county commission? So um, it, are you asking for my personal opinion or my understanding of the sta state of the law? I'd love to have them both. Let's start with the law because well, we, so we may be looking for ways to change laws and I'd be interested in your personal views from your experience. So um, as to the state of the law, I will say that the challenge presented uh, for my office, for the board, and to some extent I would imagine for the officers involved is that there is this um, inherent conflict created by the state of the law wherein there are certain uh, elected officials who are essentially embedded with the county, um, provided facilities by the county, provided either employees or supplemental employees by the county, equipment by the county, a budget for operations by the county. Those officials must interact with the county, for example, um, in order to process payment vouchers. They have to come back to the county even in instances where um, they may have independence or latitude in contracting, for example, they still need to come back to the county finance department in order to get a check cut, in order to pay um, on these contracts that they may have control over, but they can't cut a check directly to the vendor. So there is this kind of uh, built-in um, tug of war uh, where two parties who are essentially um, operating independently one is funding another without any um, necessary input or oversight into the process or uh, you know any of the contracting but essentially is on the hook when it comes to processing the payments when it comes to supplementing uh, budgets after the fact in order to make up for budgetary shortfalls because of those expenditures and ultimately may be left um, with the legal liability and exposure should there be any um, issue with the way in which those services were obtained. So I do believe there, is, there are some, some practical and legal challenges for all counties and um, elected officials who are in this kind of in-between state where you have independence but you depend on the county for finances and processing and where the county has an obligation to fund but doesn't have any control over uh, ensuring any kind of standards or protocols um, in, the, in the expenditure of those funds. Very well stated. If you are probably as knowledgeable in this uh, interface of the county governments and state elected officials or county elected officials uh, in the case of a DA is any attorney around if you have suggestions to our committee on how we might could clean this up a bit uh, through statutory amendments or modifications please feel free to give those to me okay and while I have you there at the witness chair I, I, as the county attorney I have mentioned to you sort of pre-meeting if there are any documents that you have produced to us so far you've got the whole notebook in front of you or that you may produce in the future as you complete the document production that you feel like you contain confidential personal information or otherwise privileged information please identify that to me You've been so good here to have all these documents bait stamped so we can very clearly identify which pages you're talking about. Then I will treat them as confidential uh, within this committee. We will not be making these documents public other than available for review of committee members until I hear back from you, uh, hopefully in the next week or two. Thank Fair you, enough. Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, I am going to turn the chair over to you, Madam uh, Leader, or any designate of the minority party if there's additional questions anybody uh, might want to make at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Mike Nine that um, Senator Harold Jones will. Uh, Harold Jones, all right. Question uh, number 10. You got it. Oh, you got 10. And also, no, no, not 10. You're recognized, Senator Jones. Um, 
And it's also, can Senator Estevez also ask a couple of questions too? It'll literally be like one. But I, I may cover all of them. Okay. Tell them to hand so, them to you just like you. Double's always been giving them to me. We're trying to oh, follow the rules. Yeah, I've been noticing that. <laughs> He's, He's right my assistant, just like the He's chairman right has several assistants. So. I was just looking at um, the, the code section 15, 18, 20, because that is one of the things that we maybe have some purview over. Um, so the issue about the district attorney and the spending. Now, that has been really the law in Georgia for forever. I, I mean, with the, even the case that you, you, you cited, the amusement sales case, that case cites a case that goes all the way back to 1984, which makes clear that this language about May should not be read as a shell at all, that it is a May, and that basically it's an agreement, is it not right, between the district attorney's office and the county and the local government authority of how they do this, and that that's been how we've been operating for years in Georgia. Is that not correct? Yes, I would agree that the uh, construction that's contained in the three cases that I mentioned um, has been well established since at least the 1980s in okay. Georgia. And when we talk about uh, trying to change that, um, one of the other offices that would come under that particular change, if we change this particular statute, would also have to be the sheriff's officers, too. They would also have to be changed, too, I guess, in a degree of fairness. We wouldn't just change one office, would we? So I'm, I'm not sure that an amendment to this statute would impact them since it is specifically about a district attorney's authority to hire assistant district attorneys. Well, in reality, what, oh, isn't it accurate that what we're really talking about is the constitutional office, not necessarily just district attorney? Or are, are y'all only making the position that the district attorney should be subject to a change and no other constitutional officer well, should be subject to a change? Oh, is that I'm just I'm asking any, any all three of you. So re repeat the question. Uh, is the argument that only district attorneys as constitutional officers should be subject to a change, but no other constitutional officers should be subject to a change as far as their spending patterns are concerned? No, it's not. It's not uh, specific to the district attorney. Okay. It's the, the issue that I have, and and I just be in all openness, honesty. Uh, my position is different from that of my colleagues. I have a philosophical difference with this notion of a constitutional officer being able to spend money that the legislative body has appropriated any way that he or she chooses. It may be, I understand the words, it may be legal, but being gay was illegal at one point. Interracial marriage was, was illegal. Segregation, well not illegal, <laughs> yeah, well that's illegal. Uh, discrimination was legal. So I have a philosophical difference with that. I think that we appropriate money, and, not, and I'm not singling out the idea, it's all of them. That, that's the difference. So and my colleagues don't see it as I see it. I understand, but yeah. to be consistent, yes. it would have to also include the sheriffs, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. And the, and the tax okay. commissioners, there's four of them, right? Yes, and also the clerk's office. And the clerk's office. It would include all of those. Right. Yes. This, this may be splitting hairs, but I do want to clarify that the constitutional officers under the county constitutional officers yeah. are just the four, the sheriff, yeah. the That's probate correct. judge, the clerk of the superior court, and the tax commissioner. Yeah. Uh, we would consider the district attorney to be a state constitutional officer, which is right. some but differences. They have the same kind of purview over their budget as the others do. Um, as far as they like, have some additional right. latitude and independence than other uh, other elected officials. Yes. The but sheriff. Wait a minute, you're saying the sheriff doesn't have latitude in his budget. I'm saying that. I just want to make sure that we understand that the the sheriff and the other co county constitutional officers right. don't have exactly the same independent rights as the state county uh, the state constitutional officers and I'll clarify rather than lump them all together OCGA 15 18 20 applies only to the district attorney it's yes. by its very on the face of it it doesn't apply to clerks and tax commissioners and sheriff's department and the statute has nothing it's not based on the fact that she is a state officer or state constitutional officer it's just based on the statutory authority of all district attorneys but mr chair as far as like when you're talking about the budget process you would say that those especially sheriffs they do have that opportunity to kind of control their budgets is that not right and they not also use the same argument that you cannot control their budget has the sheriff ever told you that 
Mr. Chair? Oh, me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking the county attorney. Has the sheriff ever came to you and said that you also do not have purview over his or her budget? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The, absolutely. The, 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 the four constitutional officers and the, and the district attorney, who is a state constitutional officer, yeah, the five of them there, they all say that. And, absolutely. And again, my philosophical difference with that is I just, it doesn't make any sense to me that we don't have, uh, can't tell them uh, or have no no control over how they spend their money. We appropriate the money based upon specific requests. And it's approved based upon specific requests. So when they get it, then they believe they can spend it any way they see fit. And I just disagree with that. And also, um, just along those same lines, the only thing that's, well, one of the things that's a shell in this particular statute is that the district attorney actually shall be able to actually uh, define the title of the person that she hires or he hires, they are able to do that and also fix that compensation. So that's the only shell really in here as far as this statute is concerned. Is that not right? That they have the opportunity to fix the title as far as the title that they're going to give the other employee that they hire. So with Mr. Wade, is it not right? Or anyone else, any other district attorney, they can give them any title that they want to as far as the statute is concerned. That, that was perfectly within the district attorney's purview. Which subsection are you citing from? Yeah, the district attorney shall define the duties and fix the title, line seven, on subsection A. Oh, I see. So that's been completely within his or her purview to do that, according to the statute. To fix the title, to that, determine what they're going to yeah, prosecute. Yeah, that is what the statute right. says, yes. So, so he or she would not have to come to the county commission to say that I want to have a special prosecutor for a specific um, event, whether it's election integrity or anything of that nature, because he or she shall be able to fix that particular title in their job duties. Is that not correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also kind of looking at this. From a liability standpoint, and I'm just curious, from a liability standpoint, if you guys were to start having more control over the district attorney's budget, is there any concern, I'm asking the county attorney, is there any concern from a liability standpoint? Because you know you have a lot of these cases where persons would sue the district attorney, sue the sheriff, but also sue the county. And the case law says, well, they're separate entities. And so therefore, you can't sue the county, you guys, for what the sheriff does or what the DA does, because they're separate. And what the court would do is go through a litany of things to show the separation. And one of those is that you guys don't control the budget of the DA or the sheriff. Would there be any concern that that separation then would leave? And now all of a sudden, when somebody sues the district attorney's office, they might be to sue you too. Would you have that kind of concern? So one of my least favorite things is running a complete legal analysis on the spot because sure. I don't think it's very thorough. But just um, as an initial matter, uh, as a practical matter, we are always sued with the official in, any, in most cases. Um, we frequently provide representation under our plan of defense once we undertake representation. We also provide... Um, payment of the judgment should there be one so we are already on the hook so to speak if we are sued with them I think the um, and and to make it clear I don't know that any of us are here to take a position on what should be done I think that is within the purview of your body to make legislative recommendations but an argument in favor of more control might be that if we are on the hook for the liability um, that it it is, uh, we don't have any control over the actions of the officials who are generating the potential liability, but remain on the hook for providing defense and also payment of the judgment. But in, normally in those cases, you guys are actually dismissed. And there's actually a question about, especially for sheriffs, whether you're actually technically on the hook or not. Once the, we the county, the once, county will pay it, but once it's we, not necessarily Okay, key. I will say this. In the yeah. 27 years that I have worked in government defense, 
I have never known any of the governmental entities I have worked with not to pay the judgment should there be one after we have undertaken representation. And under the current um, iteration of our plan of defense in Fulton County, once we undertake representation, um, unless there is cause and we discontinue representation, we would be uh, providing uh, payment of the judgment should there be one or settlement. But from a standpoint, um, being sued, Mr. Chair, would that give you any concern that when a district attorney now is sued, they're also going to bring, they can legally bring in Fulton County if you guys started trying to dictate salaries? It's a possibility um, that that could happen. Would that give you any concern? Probably. Okay. Um, and, and, I, and I bring that up because just in, two, in first many cases, but in 2023, you have a federal court case that says Fulton, well, county has to be dismissed because the law in Georgia shows that it exclusively that the district attorney is a separate entity from the county. And one of the things that they point out is that the district attorney controls the compensation and counties only possess the power to approve the amount. And so I guess I, my point just is, you said it would concern you, if you get into the business now of actually trying to control compensation, it might just do an intermingling. And that's just a question that I had, and you, and you answered it. Um, someone had spoken about the open checkbook. Can you kind of tell us about that, that you were saying you could go online about the open checkbook? Uh, Can you yes. kind of tell us what that is? It's an open part of our open government platform. Um, if you uh, go to the county's website under Inside Fulton, it's like on the far right, Inside Fulton, um, sc scroll down from that, um, you'll find a button that you can press that will take you to our open government platform. We have, uh, we have open budget where you can go and look and see what the budget and actual expenditures are open checkbook, I believe it goes back five years, <clears throat> includes um, vendor payments. It's updated. Currently, I believe it's updated on a weekly basis. Um, but that information has been out there uh, for for a while. In fact, it's, it's, go ahead. It's been, we've had a service interruption as a result of our cyber incident. So we're just now, um, in the last week or so, been able to bring that back online. Yeah, because my colleague over here is totally fascinated by it because you can actually pull up every count, not county, every law firm or whatever that's getting business in real time and see exactly what their bills are. Can you not? You can see their payment payments, amounts. Payments, right. Yes. Right. You can actually see their payments amount up to, I believe, you said it's updated weekly. Yes, it should be updated weekly. So a lot of the questions that we have as far as like payments and openness, it seems to me that you guys actually are very open, doing way more than Richmond County, quite frankly, that you guys are very open as far as how this process works. We, we have been working on our um, transparency uh, for a while now. But yes, we, we try to have um, as much information um, available as possible. I don't have anything else, Mr. Chair. Senator Jones, while we got you here as an ex-solicitor, how, how is a solicitor's budget handled? Is it the same as the DA's or different? Is it, uh, it's, it's a similar situation. S solicitors are elected by the people for their judicial circuit. Are, there, or, or are they on a county basis or a judicial circuit? Oh. Well, if you have one, you're on a county basis. Okay. Because every county not, does not necessarily have to have a solicitor. They would only have that if they had a state court. Right. Okay. Yeah. So who, the way our budget works is. the solicitor and the county. assistant solicitors? The county. counties? Yes. Totally. County. Totally. Okay. And so the way it works is you just apply, put your budget request in, and they approve it or don't approve it, which okay. normally they're going to approve it. And they give you a lot of discretion. Now, can a solicitor have the same opportunity to say as a constitutional officer? Uh, that was my next question. I, yeah, I yeah. don't know. Can we, do we have that same opportunity? No. But it also is a prosecutor's office. So normally um, they're very they're hands more off. open as far as yeah. hands off. Exactly. Yeah, let, allow for prosecutorial discretion. They're always going to give more latitude as far as that is concerned, especially on prosecutorial discretion. Yes, absolutely. So no state funds go to fund the 
solicitor, assistant solicitors. As far it, as if they, it can be like, like a victim's assistance grant or something of that yeah. nature may be in there. But domestic other violence than that, prosecutor right, if you had like a stuff. domestic violence, pro that might yeah. be in there. Um, that's something new that we, was around when I was there. But, but primarily you're going to the county. Okay. That has been sort of banging around in my mind when you started talking about all the different type of courts that the ORCA funds went to. Some of those are county only, like your magistrate court, your municipal court, your state court, whereas superior court system, now you're into state salaries, et cetera. Okay. Y'all have been fantastic and very patient and very cooperative with our committee, and we appreciate that. Thank you all for being here today, and I will await any additional uh, documents that you might be able to produce uh, to me. And uh, Ms. Joe, of course, if you'll let me know about anything that's privileged or confidential before we put anything posted to the public site. Um, I will, and I also committed that I would look at the um, ethics code regarding gifts and honoraria. And I wanted to let you know that I did find the sections that I was thinking of. All right, you want to tell me? Uh, yes, I will go through it real quickly, Sections. hopefully. Um, so there is a prohibition for of any officer or employee to solicit or receive um, any gift uh, from a prohibited source. The prohibited source is um, defined as uh, someone, among other things, who is seeking official action from or seeking to do business with the county. Um, as far as the disclosure requirements, every year there are certain officials who are required to fire, uh, file a financial disclosure. Um, this includes all elected officials of Fulton County. And um, one of the things that is required to be reported is any honorarium from a single source in an aggregate amount of 500 or more. And it also includes going back to the $100 um, or less for nominal gifts that are uh, excluded from the prohibition. Uh, if you receive something of value of $100 or more, that should be included in your disclosure as well. Does that have an ordinance number? Yes, it is. Code section number? It is code sections 2-67. And... 2-69 and 2-79 all of those are part of our ethics code that what, are codified as ordinance for Fulton County what do you call the disclosure form you mentioned I guess it's a gift disclosure an honorary or um, it's an it's an annual financial disclosure the section is entitled disclosure of income and financial interests so you list um, any income you make outside of the county and other real property that's owned uh, and any gifts that were received, any financial interests that are covered in these um, in these sections A through C need to be included in the disclosure. And that is required to be filed by the uh, district attorney as well as an elected official she would be required to file I am required to file most of our executive team is required to file Ms. Whitmore have I requested that in your opinion you have okay. and it's included in your binder right. section Thanks. 11 thank you so much no. oh. all right Par I, partially uh, included partially included I in section I understand <laughs> it's a work in progress and I know the cyber <laughs> attack has been a problem and, and whatnot y'all yeah, doing everything yeah. we can uh, committee members, I apologize for the late notice of this meeting, and I appreciate y'all's efforts to be here. I am looking at my calendar now for a potential next meeting, and I wanted to bounce off of you guys the dates of May 23rd or 24th. That's a Thursday, Friday, three weeks out. If You, you don't have to tell me right here on the spot, but if y'all would please check your schedules and, and let me know, because I certainly want to accommodate everybody that's spending their time with this uh, committee and just bounce it back off to me or my admin Cindy and we'll let you know in the next week or so if we're going to be able to have that and with that we are adjourned thank you thank you